Oh, we're using our tap here? No, this is mine. Oh, Yours right. is still down. Right. Um, if you want to control the lights, it's over here. If you want to change it, this is meeting right now. If right. you want to go to the slideshow. Uh -huh. It's just all automatic. Go with the lights here. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, and meeting is the regular. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Come, Bertie. Yes, sir. 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 Okay, alright, everybody. Alright. I'm gonna have everyone practice five speakers, and then I'll get to the end. That's a model. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll just make sure that you do it while we still remember. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Oh, Hey. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? <coughs> Sorry. I was poking you with provocative responses, expecting some fireworks. There's still nothing I land in the new Harley response or something. What the hell? So she must really be busy. Just, Let's go ahead. Uh, you know? I'm trying to ride her up with this response. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
$1,000 is bitching about it on such short notice. All right, whatever. Showing your film? No. Okay, we can run it off that mic. Can you turn off your phone? Do you know how to do that? Still learning. Yeah. It's classical order when you have a way. आगे आगे बैठो इतनी दूर से हम आए हमें देखने आए हैं लोग सीरियसली इन इन एग्जॉस्टिंग मोड राइट नाउ अरुण आई थिंक यू आर मेंट टू बी हियर सो मेरे सो ऑल दिस वाज ताज़े सब आप भी आगे आ जाएं I assume it will work, but it yeah, right. try. you showed me how to do the lights. Do the, the lights. lights. There's like a button. Do you know how the sound works? You want to try? Just run a snippet. Hi. Hello. I'm a Reddy here. Hi, Reddy here. Hi, Reddy. You want to be on the end? I'm uh, I'm a I have documents. Like, We're actually getting up. How was the 
It was fine. Yeah. I'm carrying on the terrorist. I'm hearing you lazy. That's what I'm saying. I need to torture and thinking, oh. <laughs> Secondary started. Oh, it's insulting. No? I'm not working hard enough. What's the next to the disease person? <laughs> Do you want something? Chai? Um, I'm going to drink something. Yes, I'm going to drink something. Yes, I'm going to drink something. Are we set? Do you want to make sure? Are you all set? Yeah. Yes, she is. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I think it was a good time. Should we wait or should we go? I don't know, I think we should go. Yeah. Let's go. Thank you, everyone, again, for being here. Um, it's really my honor and my pleasure to introduce this panel. Um, two uh, people on this panel have are fresh off the, the plane, from um, one from uh, Kigali, Rwanda, and one from London. So I leave it up to you guess who's from where. <laughs> but um, it's, it's really, a, um, I think it's a great time to revisit the questions that we I actually want to talk about here today. So let me just pull up my opening. Okay. So I'm just going to say a few lines by way of um, introducing everyone and introducing the, the panel and the idea behind the panel. And then I'm going to pass it on to the panelists. They're going to be speaking in the following order. Um, Arun, then Faisal. Sara, Madiha, and then Asim. So I'll introduce our panelists. Faisal Hashmi is the activist and former director of the Muslim Justice Initiative. I'm Sadia Thur. I'm uh, associate professor of sociology at uh, the College of Staten Island, CUNY. Um, Madiha Tahir is a writer, filmmaker, and a PhD candidate at Columbia. Um, Asim Rafiki is a photojournalist and Open Society Fellow. Sara Bilal in the middle is a human rights lawyer and uh, founder of the Justice Project Pakistan, which uh, hopefully she and Asim will talk a little bit more about since they're both involved in it. And Arun Kundanani um, is uh, the NYU professor and author of the new book, The Muslims Are Coming, which I strongly encourage you all to read. And he's a former editor of Race and Class. So um, with those introductions out of the way, uh, let me just say a few words before passing. Um, the torch on to Arun. So from the beginning, the framework of the law has been important for um, the war on terror in terms of providing legitimacy for the US attack on Afghanistan in October 2001. Um, after all, at that time itself, there was a need to frame the war um, as a just war. So the law has always been an important tool in the arsenal of the architects um, of this war, from the infamous White House memo to the debates over whether waterboarding counted as torture. Scholars such as Agamben have pointed out the use of the law as exception, which characterized almost every aspect of the um, global war on terror, from the convenient legal limbo of um, Guantanamo Bay to um, the various ways in which it is deployed in the US. So I think it was very important for us to um, have this conversation about the ways in which the discourse of law, especially around the, the war on terror, has been equated with justice. So as long as you can define the war as legal or the things that are happening um, under the rubric of this war as legal, then somehow that means that justice has been served and we can sort of move on. And I think what all the speakers here are going to touch upon in one way or the other is, in fact, the ways in which this very idea of the law has obscured um, issues of justice and, and created severe injustices, whether we're talking about the issue of um, the detainees in Guantanamo, in Bagram, um, or whether we're talking about the war on terror at home uh, within the, the the federal system, um, the surveillance of Muslim communities, the ways in which um, the law has either been rewritten, interpreted in creative ways, or um, not even used, as in the case of, say, for example, the special administrative measures, which are not even considered laws because they're administrative policy. So I think there are all these different ways in which the law is simultaneously um, being used as a way to articulate the various aspects of the war on terror um, domestically as well as internationally, 
And whether it's silent or not silent on, on various issues is equally important for questions of justice, as um, we'll discuss here today. So uh, having said that, I want to um, pass the mic on to Arun to set the sort of broad framework for our conversation here today. OK, thank you. Um, so a, a couple of weeks ago on a, on a kind of cold Monday evening, um, I stood with dozens of other people outside the Metropolitan Correction Center in um, Lower Manhattan. It was one of those absolutely freezing nights and I really hate the cold, um, but I had to be there. Why? One of the specific reasons is the case of Fahad Hashmi, um, which you'll be hearing about later from his brother Faisal. Um, Fahad was held in pretrial detention at this prison for nearly three years, during which time he was subjected to solitary confinement, a form of mental torture that makes a mockery of any notion of justice and Fahad's case is one of many. We stand outside the center on the first Monday of every month to say to New Yorkers, look, this building, which looks like just another federal building in, in Lower Manhattan, is a place where people are tortured, where justice has disappeared. And we wanna make this place visible. We wanna put this building on the map as a place of shame. The group I'm involved with that is organizing these monthly vigils is called No Separate Justice. And what I want to do over the next few minutes is to reflect on how a system of separate justice comes into being. How is it that a criminal justice system ostensibly operating according to the rule of law and the principle of equality can produce outcomes that are shaped so profoundly by racial and religious difference? As a way into answering this question, I want to begin with the story of an African-American Muslim from Detroit called Abdullah Lukman. He was the imam of a mosque on Detroit's impoverished west side. Every Sunday, he and his followers ran a soup kitchen seeking to provide for the basic needs of the local community. The majority of people in the neighborhood are either unemployed or in um, exceptionally low paying jobs and they depend on such initiatives for their survival. His son, Omar Regan, told me Imam Lukman's favorite word was grassroots. That's how my dad would talk. He's from back in the 60s, he said. Lukman Abdullah converted to Islam in the early 1980s after serving in the military and then falling into depression. The inspiration for his conversion was Jamil al-Amin, who was known in the 1960s as HRAP Brown. Brown had been a leading activist with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Over the course of a decade, he rose to the top of the FBI's target list of black revolutionaries. And soon enough, the Bureau found its opportunity to imprison him on incitement to riot charges. While in prison in New York in 1971, Rat Brown converted to Orthodox Islam for reasons that were no doubt similar to those which led Lukman Abdullah to do the same a decade later. By the time the war on terror was launched in 2001, much of this 60s generation of black radical activists had been exhausted, co-opted, imprisoned, or killed, to a large degree victims of the FBI's efforts to destroy the movement through the COINTEL program. COINTELPRO was a sustained and coordinated campaign to thwart constitutionally protected activism and counteract political dissent during the 1960s. Targets included the civil rights and black liberation movements, the Puerto Rican independence movement, anti-war and student movements. Martin Luther King was placed under intense surveillance and attempts were made to destroy his marriage and induce his suicide. In various cities, the Black Panther Party was disrupted by using fake letters and informants to stir up violence between rival factions and gangs. Those responsible for the program were never brought to justice for their activities, and similar techniques continued to be used in the 1980s against, for example, the American Indian Movement and the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. Lukman Abdullah was one of the leaders of the campaign to free Jamil Al-Amin from prison. As his son Omar Regan puts it, he was unfinished business from the days of COINTELPRO. And now the war on terror provided a new lens through which to view his activities. Soon the FBI was categorizing Abdullah as a, as a quote, highly placed leader of a nationwide radical fundamentalist Sunni group consisting primarily of African Americans, who had called his followers to an offensive jihad rather than a defensive jihad in order to establish a separate sovereign Islamic state within the borders of the United States governed by Sharia law. End quote. So the implication was that he shared an ideology with Al-Qaeda. In the 60s, figures like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali had been portrayed by the media as Muslim extremists. Now, a new set of images of Islamic extremism had come to the fore, images that could be used to manufacture an ideological connection 
between a, ra a radical black preacher and de on Detroit's west side and the events of September the 11th, 2001. In 2007, the FBI found its opportunity to begin targeting Imam Luqman's mosque. A member of the congregation had recently been arrested on murder charges, and in a deal with law enforcement, he agreed to work with a counterterrorism squad of the FBI's Detroit field office as part of a sting operation. I won't go into the details of the, of the operation. Um, you can read the full story in my book. But essentially, the FBI paid very large sums of money to lure those around Imam Luqman into helping fence stolen goods and then gradually drawing Imam Luqman into the operation so that he would be present at the FBI's warehouse when the time came to carry out this raid. There seems little doubt that Imam Luqman viewed the US government as an oppressor and called on his followers to organize against it. Like the Black Panther Party, members of the mosque also carried guns, but there was no evidence of any terrorism, just small-time hustlers in an impoverished neighborhood struggling to pay the bills while denouncing America. But in order to justify a sting operation on this scale, journalists were told that the mosque was a hotbed of violent fundamentalists. It proved easier to convict the imam of terrorism in the court of public opinion than in a court of law. When the time came to finally spring their trap on the morning of October 28, 2009, 60 law enforcement officers surrounded the warehouse, including a, spe a special operations team the FBI had flown in from Quantico, Virginia, a SWAT team from the FBI's Detroit field office, and officers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. At a prearranged time, the three informants exited the warehouse and explosives were let, let off inside the building as a distraction. A dozen federal agents approached Imam Luqman and his colleagues and commanded them to get down and show their hands. His four associates complied, but Imam Luqman delight, delayed for a moment before lying face down on the trailer floor. Accounts of what happened next differ, but like, most, most likely, Suspecting that Imam Luqman was holding a gun to his chest, the agents released a dog that had been trained to grab his arm, and as the dog bit at his face, Imam Luqman fired at its chest, prompting return of fire from four of the agents who were positioned nearby. He was killed instantly by semi-automatic rifles from a few feet away. As Imam Luqman's body lay handcuffed on the warehouse floor, the police dog was evacuated by helicopter to a hospital for possible life-saving treatment. The Department of Justice exonerated the FBI's handling of the arrest and declared the killing lawful. But there is little doubt that had the government chosen not to infiltrate his mosque and entrap him in a cr criminal conspiracy of its own invention, he would still be alive. The killing of Imam Luqman ba barely registered in the news media. From one point of view, the manner of his death was hardly different from the dozens of other killings of African Americans each year at the hands of militarized law enforcement agencies. From another perspective, he resembled the thousands of unnamed so-called militants killed by drones in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen. Whether as a so-called Islamic extremist or as an African-American, his death was a perfectly normal occurrence. The criminalization of Imam Luqman is in fact a textbook case of current FBI tactics in the domestic war on terror. Over the last decade, the majority of terrorist prosecutions have involved the targeting of people for their ideology and then the use of informants and undercover agents acting as agent provocateurs. In all these cases, someone working for the FBI provides not only the plan, but also the means and opportunity for whatever crimes take place. Without the FBI's help in supplying money, weapons, and a specific plan of attack, the accused would not have the capability to carry out any plot. In at least some cases, it appears FBI agent provocateurs were able to manipulate vulnerable people with mental health or drug addiction problems into conspiring in acts of planned violence they would otherwise not have been predisposed to. To a large degree, the FBI is fantasizing into existence the very threat of domestic Muslim terrorism it claims it is fighting. The only radicalization occurring in these cases is the FBI's own. Most other terrorism prosecutions involve activities the government considers to be so-called material support for terrorism, but which, which would likely have been considered lawful before 9-11. Often what, what is happening here is the prosecution of individuals for what they say rather than for what they do. For instance, in 2009, Tarek Mahana, a US citizen from Boston, was charged with conspiring to provide material support to a terrorist organization for translating a widely available online document and distributing videos online. Activities historically understood as free expression protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. In April 2012, he was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. 
He had earlier twice refused to work as an informant for the FBI. What lies behind this strategy is a mode of thinking that has become entrenched in the way the US government seeks to prevent terrorist attacks. The concept of radicalization has become the chief lens through which Western societies now view Muslim populations. On both sides of the Atlantic, so-called terrorism experts have advanced theories of radicalization that claim to be able to identify individuals who are not terrorists now, but might be at some later date. And the key question here is, how do you identify tomorrow's terrorists today? Here, I think it's worth recalling Steven Spielberg's 2002 film Minority Report, in which a specialist pre-crime unit is imagined that uses three psychics called precogs to predict who will be murderers in the future. The unit is enabled to arrest pre-criminals before they have committed the crimes for which they are convicted. Similarly, a preventative approach to the war on terror has been pursued. In place of an actual precog's capability, security officials have turned to academic models that claim scientific knowledge of a process by which ordinary Muslims become terrorists. These models claim that there are certain behavioral, cultural, and ideological signals that can reveal who is at risk of turning into a terrorist at some point in the future. In the FBI's radicalization model, for example, there are four stages that someone goes through on their way to becoming a terrorist, what they call pre-radicalization, identification, indoctrination, and action. In the second stage, such things as growing a beard, starting to wear traditional Islamic clothing, and becoming alienated from one's former life are listed as indicators. Uh, increased activity in a pro-Muslim social group or political cause is a sign of stage three, one level away from becoming an active terrorist. So only the last stage in this model involves actual criminal conduct. But as a New York Police Department paper put it, the challenge is, quote, how to identify, preempt, and thus prevent homegrown terrorist attacks given the non-criminal element of its indicators, end quote. Significantly, all the radicalization models assume that some form of religious ideology is the root cause of terrorism, which conveniently ignores the role of our own government's foreign policies in fostering political contexts in which, within which terrorism becomes more likely. Over the last decade, millions of dollars and pounds have been invested by the US and UK governments to tr try to prove this link between religious ideology and terrorist violence. Yet, as I um, demonstrate in my book, none of the claims to have found such a link have any plausibility. But the practical consequences of, of accepting these kinds of radicalization models are far reaching. By widening the perceived threat of terrorism from individuals actively inciting, financing, or preparing terrorist attacks to a much vaguer notion of ideology, constitutionally protected activities of large numbers of people come under surveillance by the government, reviving the COINTEL practices of the 1960s. Thus, we see the systematic monitoring of Muslim religious and political life in order to detect the radicalization indicators predicted by the models. Sharing an ideology with terrorists is then considered a pre-crime, a stage in the radicalization process. Former FBI Assistant Director John Miller puts it this way, the threat isn't really from Al-Qaeda, the organization, as much as it's from Al-Qaeda-ism. Well, this is a very revealing statement. Al-Qaeda-ism is an ideological construct devised by the FBI. Deciding that this construct is the real threat means that radicals who do not espouse violence but whose ideas can be superficially associated with Al-Qaeda, such as Imam Luqman, are seen as would-be terrorists. In Minority Report, the pre-crime unit is eventually shut down when the fallibility of the pre-gogs is exposed. In the FBI and other law enforcement agencies, radicalization models with no predictive power continue to be relied upon in shaping policies of surveillance, infiltration, and entrapment. Most discussion of state surveillance attends to wiretapping, collection of internet communication data, closed circuit television cameras, and these other forms of electronic surveillance of our online and offline lives. And obviously Edward Snowden's whistleblowing has made clear the extent to which the NSA conducts warrantless surveillance of internet and phone communication globally and domestically. But the resulting debate on surveillance ignores the specific ways in which it impacts on the everyday lives of so-called suspect communities. And it ignores surveillance practices that involve the embedding of intelligence gathering in personal relationships within targeted communities themselves. So when you have informants that are recruited from communities, surveillance becomes in intertwined with the fabric of human relationships 
um, and the threads of trust upon which they're built. The power and danger of these forms of surveillance derive from their entanglement in everyday human interactions at community level, rather than from the external monitoring capabilities of hidden technologies. As of 2008, the FBI had a roster of at least 15,000 informants. The proportion, the proportion assigned to infiltrating Muslim communities in the United States is unknown, but likely to be substantial. At, at least 100,000 Muslims in America have been secretly under surveillance in one way or another since 9-11. To get a sense of the scale of surveillance, it's worth noting that the East German Stasi is estimated to have had one spy for every 66 citizens. From what we know about the number of FBI intelligence analysts and informants working on counterterrorism in relation to Muslim American communities, it seems that the FBI has a spy for every 94 Muslims in the United States, before one adds the resources of the National uh, Security Agency, the regional uh, intelligence fusion centers and the counterterrorism resources of local police departments, which means that Muslims in the United States are likely to be exposed to levels of state surveillance similar to which the East German population faced from the Stasi. The wider social costs of this surveillance are significant. Because ideologies circulating among Muslim populations have been identified as precursors to terrorism, the perception grows that Muslims have a special problem with radicalization. Intimidated by this kind of general mood, you find that leaders uh, of targeted Muslim communities align themselves with the government and offer themselves as allies willing to oppose and expose dissent within the community. Everyone who rejects this game of fake patriotism falls under suspicion as opposition to extremism becomes the only legitimate discourse. To be classed as moderate, Muslims in the US are expected to constrain their religion to the private sphere but also to speak out publicly against extremists' misinterpretations of Islam. They're supposed to see themselves as liberal individuals, but also declare an allegiance to the national collective. They're meant to put their capacity for reason above blind faith, but not let it lead to criticisms of the West. And they have to publicly condemn using violence to achieve political ends, except when their own governments do so. No wonder moderate Muslims are said to be hard to find. Finally, the spectacle of the Muslim extremist renders invisible the violence of the US empire. Opposition to such, to such violence falls silent as the universal duty of countering extremism precludes any wider discussion of foreign policy. And this is exactly the, func the function that Islamophobia serves, so that instead of having a political understanding of the conflicts that our governments have led us into, we spend our time dwelling on concepts of Muslim culture and extremist ideology. It's a way of dehumanizing the victims and undermining solidarity. So we think it's their culture, not our politics, that is the problem. The formula is similar to the use of ideas of black culture to avoid facing up to the institutional violence of the criminal justice system. It's worth noting here that the drone strike program is also shaped by assumptions about radicalization. The Obama administration's official reason for the extrajudicial killing of uh, Anwar al alaki by a US drone strike in September 2011 is that he had an operational role in Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. But it's likely the real reason was the fear that his online propaganda worked like a kind of ideological virus, infecting an audience in the West and driving them to commit acts of terrorism. But his having this role is only plausible if one accepts models of radicalization in which religious ideology mechanically causes people to be violent. Again, the evidence for this is slight. How are we to make sense of these practices of surveillance and entrapment that we would normally associate with a police state? Our current models of totalitarianism, <coughs> largely derived from the Cold War, are poorly equipped to account for them. Whether derived from fiction or history, they usually picture a narrow, ideologically driven elite controlling the mass of the population. Such a state of affairs is normally assumed to be incompatible with a formal democratic process. But the experience of the war on terror suggests that if the same tools of totalitarian rule are applied not to the population as a whole, but only to racialized groups, the trappings of democracy can be maintained for the majority while a minority is subjected to the techniques of a secret police. The key to such seemingly inconsistent democratic totalitarianism is a racialized discourse that constructs Muslims as a cultural threat to the liberal order. This enables the separation of Muslims from the usual liberal norms of rights and citizenship. 
And it's on this basis that Muslim dissent is read not as an attempt to use the political process to hold states accountable to their own liberal standards, but only as the intrusion of alien cultural values into the public sphere. From this perspective, the totalitarianism, the war on terror, intersects with other racialized regimes, such as the war on drugs and the militarized policing of immigration, in which similar patterns of discriminatory surveillance, brutality, and incarceration are central. In 1967, Martin Luther King told an audience at Riverside Church in New York that it was impossible to condemn without hypocrisy the violence of angry young, young men within America unless one also condemned the state violence of our own government. He said, I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. It's a point that remains as valid today in the era of the terror wars global battlefield. It's a time once again, it's time once again to heed King's, King's message of peace by ending the war on terror and unraveling the racisms and totalitarianisms that it fosters. Thank you. Next we have um, Faisal Hashmi. So I'm reading Arun's book right now. I'm in the middle of it. And uh, he goes into these stories in detail. And I, I would recommend everybody, because I, like I told Arun, I read all these books on what's going on with the Muslim experience in America uh, since 2001. Anything I could get my hands on. Uh, so that's my plug for <laughs> what Arun is talking about. Uh, thank you, uh, Sadia, for inviting me and, let me and giving me a chance to speak about these topics. Uh, so Arun talked about a particular case and what was most uh, relevant to me was a person got shot, he was handcuffed and bled to death, and they airlifted the dog uh, so they could save the dog. And that you know, like I said before, I read about the Muslim experience in America. That's the value of Muslims in America right now. You know, a dead dog or a police dog is more important than an entrapped Muslim in some made up grand larceny case, which involved Quantico, the FBI, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, everybody for a case that didn't exist. You know, somebody that they targeted. And that's, that's, that's the issue at hand here. Uh, when Sadia brought this to my attention that she wanted to do this event with a bunch of Pakistanis talking about what's going on in Pakistan, <coughs> and me being a Pakistani, you know, of Pakistani descent growing up here, I, was, I grappled with, you know, what is law, you know, because that's what I left. What, you know, I left Pakistan in 1982 under martial law, uh, you know, in the streets of Karachi. That's what I left. And I came here, and I see people nodding to, thinking back to th that experience. Uh, I left it here because I was told there was a different experience here. And I, was, I was three years old. I was told a lot of things. I was told I'd get candy and everything <laughs> when I get here. Uh, but then we arrived here in America. And uh, I grew up in America. I grew up in Queens. I'm from Flushing. I had a hip hop infused childhood. I, you know, I went to public school in Queens public school in the Bronx. I am a native New Yorker by all sense. And uh, that's me. And I had a younger brother that was a year younger than me who had a similar experience. I was a more brainy type and he was a more, you know, hangout type. Uh, but then the roles got reversed uh, when we got older. And uh, I grew up watching Law and Order, you know, the TV show. I grew up watching Divorce Court. I grew up watching this, this sense of justice, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer when I grew up. And, uh, and I had this whole picture of what was fair and what was just. And you know, America is this great place where the, you know, the good guys win in the end. And what I grappled with was law and justice, these concepts of law and justice and how they relate to each other. Uh, but you know, there, there came a certain point in my uh, late teenage years where I started adopting you know, a different understanding of what law and justice was about. I started reading about foreign policy. I started reading Chomsky and Zinn and whoever else you know, had these ideas. And I said, wow. So there's, there's a bill of goods that I was sold growing up. I was indoctrinated to in, in Queens. And there's the reality of what justice is. 
So I started having a belief about the law. The law is a tool wielded by people in power, you know? And the law justifies anything. From a foreign policy perspective, to me in Pakistan, it's wielded as a hammer. You know, drone strikes come, they descend down, and everybody else is collateral damage. And it's all justifiable because they define the law. They say, you know, anybody in the vicinity of a drone strike is an enemy combatant because the people in power can do these type of things. In the domestic experience of Muslims in America, it's wielded as a scalpel. They take people and they make examples out of them. They made an example of Imam Luqman Abdullah. They made examples out of uh, Ahmed Abu Ali. They made examples out of many, many people throughout the American landscape, uh, Muslims in America. And you have to pay attention to these particular cases because they send messages. And uh, well, what I got was a particular message. <clears throat> what are the consequences of, of, of uh, these domestic cases? What am I talking about? People being indicted in these material support terrorism cases, uh, people being indicted in various terrorism cases uh, throughout America is that they traumatize a particular community. They oppress a particular group of people to say, listen, you're being monitored, you're being surveilled, and you'll have agent provocateurs that will set you up in ridiculous cases. So there is a slew of ridiculous cases where people got set up. Uh, my brother's case, and I'll get to my brother's case, is not one of those cases. It's a, it's a particularly different political case. Uh, what do you learn about uh, these cases? You learn that the emperor has no clothes. It's all a farce. It's a hypocrisy. We, again, wielded, power being wielded by uh, the FBI, the US attorney, the attorney general to kind of send a message. Uh, John Brennan can make a speech and talk about drone strikes. And he said, and uh, you know, there can be uh, people talking about how great John Brennan is. And you know, he's a monk that decides on people's lives and deaths in, in Pakistan. But at the same time, Eric Holder also makes decisions domestically. And his, his, his cadre of US attorneys make dom decisions domestically. Who are they? Chris Christie's a US attorney. Chris Christie became famous for indicting uh, some hapless brothers, uh, Albanian brothers in, uh, in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, named the Duca brothers. They are serving a uh, life sentence plus 30 years and 50 years. On a particular case, if you examine the merits of the case, they had no idea what they were convicted of. They didn't know they were part of a particular plot until the very end. But the, the case was brought uh, on them from Chris Christie. So people make their careers out of them. You know, Rudy Giuliani was a US attorney. He made his career out of the indicting mob figures. Now, other US attorneys get uh, lionized and they have their presence known and they, you know, they become leaders of, of America. So that's, that's the track record if you wanna be a, a person of power or influence. Uh, so let's go back to my brother's case. You know, we had this experience growing up here uh, coming from Pakistan and being raised in New York. Uh, he also had similar uh, awakening about what was right, what was wrong, what was going on in the world. And his, his tangent, uh, similar to mine, brought him closer to his religion. So when he was in high school, uh, he started becoming more an activist and then he went to college. He, went, he ended up going to Brooklyn College, uh, graduating with a degree in poli sci. <laughs> but at the time, at the, and this, he graduated in 2003, from post 2001 to 2003, he spent a lot of times, a lot of time uh, at different embassies. He was at the Indian embassy, he was at the Russian embassy, he was at the Israeli embassy, protesting the treatment of Muslims uh, throughout the world. And he's always, you know, giving lectures about American foreign policy at, at Brooklyn College. So he had this reputation, he had this experience. And then he decided, once he graduated, that he wanted to go do uh, a master's in international relations at London Metropolitan University. He's my younger brother, his name is Fahad. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even uh, mention his name. So again, we're very close, we grew, we're a year apart, but different personalities altogether. And Fahad said, listen, I'm going. I said, don't go. You know, what I see in America is that they're vindictive and they will come after you, no matter what. 
he ended up saying, listen, you know, I know my rights, you know, I, I'm not doing anything. And he flew in 2004 after he graduated with a bachelor's in poli sci to London to embark on his master's in uh, pol uh, international relations at the London Metropolitan University. So in January of 2004, he had been in London for three or four months. An acquaintance of his came by the name of Junaid Babar, stayed with him for a couple of weeks, and then left. In April of 2004, Junaid Babar comes to America. Somebody, Junaid Babar is from America. He had left America after 2001, gone to Pakistan. He made his first trip back to America in 2004. In April 2004, he gets arrested. Immediately, he goes into a cooperating witness agreement with the government. People all around the world get arrested. They get arrested in major plots. So in 2004, uh, five people in uh, London got arrested in this uh, the fertilizer case, a bombing case. The Junaid Babur said he's part of some bombing plot in London. Uh, one person in uh, Canada gets arrested. Some people in uh, Pakistan get arrested, all under uh, Junaid Babur's testimony that he's part of various plots with these people. My brother in, does not get arrested in 2004. Nothing happens to him. All these other cases occur, they start, and uh, Junaid Babur for the next two years is a witness against these people. Um, he is a witness because he's facing charges. He immediately get, goes into a cooperation agreement with the government where if he testifies against, uh, against these people, he will shave time off of his sentence. A full two years later, in uh, June of 2006, my brother had graduated with his poly, uh, international relations master's. He gets arrested at the airport at Heathrow. His arrest at Heathrow, you know, well, it came to us as a shock that, we, you know, as a family, our American dream, our American experience completely crumbled. You know, there's a slew of us here. We're, we're you know, I have uncles and aunts and I have deep roots in New York. For everybody in our family and our larger community, which is hundreds of people, you know, that became an example. He gets arrested in London on an indictment from New York. For, we don't know why he's arrested in uh, June 6, 2006. The next day, uh, Brian Williams of the Nightly News opens up the Nightly News with my brother's arrest and says that he's part of some great uh, bombing plot in London. Well, that's the other plot. He's not part of this. But he opens up, imagine waking up and the Nightly News at 6.30 with Brian Williams opens up. It's your brother and his arrest is being talked about. And it's not even what he's arrested for. We don't really know what he's arrested for. Because uh, he is held on an extradition uh, indictment from uh, America. He's, he's fighting extradition to, to be flown back to America. So in the 11 months after June, uh, we find out the case against him is the following. It's a material support statute where four counts of material support are leveled against him. Two counts of conspiracy and two counts of actual material support. The case is that Junaid Babur stayed with him in 2004. In Junaid Babur's uh, luggage, he had ponchos, raincoats, and waterproof socks that he kept in his luggage. After he left my brother's apartment, he gave those to uh, fighters in uh, Afghanistan. Not that my brother had ponchos, waterproof socks that he purchased for Al-Qaeda, but this person did, and he held it, uh, that he, he housed him. My brother had four counts of material support. Two counts of conspiracy are 15, 15 years each. The other two counts of material support are 20, 20. That's 70 years leveled against him for socks and ponchos and somebody else's luggage. And I kid you not, to this day, that is the case against my brother. There's nothing else. There's no other case against my brother that this person stayed with him and this person, Junaid Babur, had these type of things uh, in his luggage. We hired lawyers. My brother was extradited back in 2007 to uh, America. And now we'll talk about justice and the system of law. Immediately, under the presumption of innocence, he comes to New York City, to the MCC, and he's put into solitary confinement. He's put into this place, which is like basically a dungeon in downtown Manhattan. He's kept in 23-hour solitary confinement. He spent a year in Belmarsh Prison in England, where he wasn't in solitary confinement. He comes here, he's, he's put into solitary confinement. Uh, in this solitary confinement, he's put in this prison that has a very bad track record. They keep the lights on. They put him in a special housing unit. 
How bad of a record? This particular unit he's put into made waves when Bernie Madoff was put into this unit. So, you know, the, the, the newspaper articles were, it's inhumane to pe keep anybody in there, right? While he was there, Bernie Madoff also came through and visited. But for, for Bernie Madoff, it's inhumane. For the dog, you know, he gets airlifted. So this is my indicators of what the Muslim presence in America really means. Because, you know, uh, our humanity is stripped. We're not human. The lights need to be kept on. You need to be put into solitary confinement. You don't have access to your family. For five months, he's in uh, the special housing unit, and we have weekly access to him. Afterwards, the U.S. Attorney General at the time, Michael McCasey, or I think it was Alberta Gonzalez, signs off on special administrative measures. Now, we're talking about the law as practiced. It's all legal. This is all justifiable. These are administrative measures. These special administrative measures are draconian measures to, uh, to curtail his communication to the outside world. Why did these special administrative measures ever come into place? It's to stop gang members to, from ordering hits. <laughs> My brother's never been arrested. He's on trial for socks and punches in somebody else's luggage, but reflexively, the, the US attorneys are allowed to do this. We fought it, we lost in the court of law, right? We, we asked the judges, you know, these are unfair. It's fair, we said so. So he's put under special administrative measures. His lawyers have to go, to CIA, go through CIA clearance to, be, to see evidence against them, he cannot see evidence that's against him. So three years transpire from 2007 to 2010. What happens in these three years? There was a campaign that was launched about my brother's case. And how am I doing on time, Sa Sadia? Five more minutes. Oh, all right, five more minutes. Uh, in these three years, this campaign is launched. And we brought my brother's case into the public sphere. I mean, if you want to look, Google my brother's name, Fahad Hashmi, you will find that you know, there's many articles from many people that talk about the injustices of his case. Uh, what's the problem? You know, what, the problem is that who wields the power of indictment in America? What's, what is the, uh, what's behind the veil between, because if you're indicted, that, that you're already, it, it, you're already at a loss. There's a 99% conviction rate uh, if, one, if somebody gets indicted. So how do you mitigate yourself? Most people mitigate themselves through plea deals. Uh, my brother wasn't going, to, going with a plea deal from our understanding. He was becoming hardened. He had, he had uh, three years in uh, special administrative measures, three years in pretrial under the presumption of innocence, uh, solitary confinement. Uh, but, and we as a family could not communicate out what we, what any of his communications, what he thought. That was part of the special administrative measures. Anybody that knows anything about Lynn Stewart, that's what she was convicted of, violating the SAMs. So this campaign was brought and we, we, we had 500 academics sign a, uh, a, uh, a letter basically saying that there's three points in my brother's case. That his conditions of confinement pre-trial are torture, they're draconian, that his due process is violated if he can't see the evidence against him. And the crux of the case against my brother that the government wanted to bring up was his protected free speech, his uh, protesting, his political beliefs. That's what they wanted to bring against him. A couple of days before his trial, our, our campaign put out a, a poster that said 500 at 500, which means we wanted 500 people at 500 Pearl Street, which is the courthouse. Uh, the U.S. attorney filed an indict, um, filed a, uh, an anonymous jury motion, which they said they wanted the jury to be anonymous, meaning that they, they would, it's not a sequestered jury, that they wanted them to come uh, into the jury room uh, under armed guard because that 500 to 500 is a call of, an act, call of action. It's a threat to, uh, what we were saying is come 500 people, witness my brother's case, witness what's going on, witness uh, these injustices. They use this as a uh, reason to file a motion to have an anonymous jury. Basically, people in your, in your jury pool would have to come in under armed guard. And it's said in the anonymous jury motion that uh, the jury cannot help but to look out in the crowd and, uh, and uh, come to an understanding that there are people that share his jihadist sympathies. 
This is literally what it said. You know, most of our supporters at the time, or half our supporters, weren't even Muslim. They were actors and playwrights and all these people. But, you know, the U.S. attorney made the case that, you know, that uh, if, if you looked out in the crowd, they had jihadist sympathies. The judge approved. A day before his trial, we were all ready on April 27th to go to his trial. Uh, my, one of our three attorneys came back to us and said, you know, he's willing to take a plea deal. Uh, a plea is a good thing when you're in these circumstances because you're facing either 70 years, you know, or 30 years or life in jail. The U.S. attorneys uh, knocked off three of the charges to only one conspiracy charge. All four charges were for the same thing. They have the power to indict you for the same thing four times over. All four charges were for the same thing. And my brother took a plea deal for 15 years in jail. Since he took the plea deal, uh, there were like three or 400 people at his sentencing hearing. We had like four or five courtrooms packed. And, uh, you know, there is still a ground cell of sport. If you Google his name, you'll see a variety of articles about him uh, from Gene Theo Harris and other, other folks have written about him. Uh, since he took his plea deal, they shipped him off to the super maximum prison in Florence, Colorado, where he's still in solitary confinement. So he's been in solitary confinement for socks and ponchos and somebody else's luggage for the past seven years. He's been in jail for eight years altogether. Uh, he's got another four years to go, according to the, uh, the, the Bureau of Prison Math or the Federal Bureau of Prison Math, so that then he'll be out. Uh, there's a lot of things that have to be said, you know, about his, his particular case. The fact that he was indicted in the first place, uh, who, ha who wields the power of indictment, the cooperating witness and his incentives. He basically, uh, three years ago, uh, he, there was an article that he's released from uh, any police custody or detention and he's a free man. He's a cooperating witness in a whole bunch of uh, people's cases. And uh, that goes back to the, the themes that I was talking about is law and justice, right? They're, they're not synonymous here. It, it doesn't go hand in hand here. It's a tool that has been wielded oppressively for a long, long time. It, before the Muslims, it was you know, Martin Luther King and anybody they could uh, you know, throw under the bus during the Civil Rights Movement, but the Muslims have a bleak future going forward. It's not a, a, a rosy picture for us going forward. So. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you. I hate having to cut to you. I'm sorry to have to do the aggressive time management, but we have so many wonderful speakers, and we want to make sure we have room for question and answers. So I'm really sorry. Oh, no worries. So next we have Sarah Bilal. Hi, everyone. Um, so I uh, am the director of the Justice Project. We are a law firm, um, a nonprofit law firm in Pakistan that represents uh, Pakistani detainees in the war on terror. Uh, we focus on um, Bagram, which is the largest US detention facility. Um, at one point, I mean, everyone's heard of Guantanamo Bay, but very few people, even in our part of the world, have heard of Bagram. Um, <laughs> did, are people here familiar with Bagram? Do you know what it is? Okay, we call it Guantanamo's evil twin, right? Um, it's because nobody really knows that much about it. And it's been there since 2000, since the very beginning of the war on terror. And it, at its highest point, was housing thousands and thousands of um, detainees. Um, they were, they were at, you know, pre-2007, there were even CIA black sites that were within that facility. It's a, um, it's a very large U.S. air air base, um, and it has the prison on one side, um, and then it has the CIA facilities and stuff. Um, why are we focusing on Bagram? Because out of um, a lot of the third country nationals, uh, so ba ba you know, Bagram has thousands of Afghan prisoners there as well, um, but out of, there's around 60 thir third country nationals, we call them GCNs, uh, Pakistanis make up the highest number of third country nationals at Bagram. So out of those 60, 40 were Pakistani. Um, our Pakistani, actually, six just got released, so now it's 36. Um, what we wanted to talk about, just what I wanted to talk about building on, um, you know, what my colleagues here have spoken about is that um, this notion of um, 
how these war on tensions are used to um, actually you know, disappear people and, um, you know, obfuscate who they are. And the longer you spend time in a facility such as that, um, you know, how the charges that are initially leveled against you kind of fade into obscurity and you become more and more dangerous just by the amount of time that you've spent there. Um, and again, it's all done behind a veil of secrecy from, you know, even knowing who these people are that are in there to, you know, what are they being tried, help, or, you know, what are they, they being charged for? to uh, what is the evidence against them, to you know, how do you get them back and where do they go. Um, since, uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, you know, who these Pakistanis are that are there, how we found out about them, and what we've been doing in Pakistan to try to get them back, repatriated to Pakistan. Um, in in post-2001, um, in September 11th, what happened is that the United States um, uh, launched this very aggressive bounty hunting program in Pakistan. Um, there were matches, I remember, any matchbox that you used to get in Pakistan, you have really shitty matches. As a smoker, I have a personal problem with that. <laughs> you get these really shitty matches, so you're using a lot of matchboxes. And, and you used to see the names and pictures of people and information saying, if you have information leading to the capture of any terrorist, you get paid an X, uh, you know, amount of thousands of dollars. Now in Pakistan, uh, you know, getting five thousand dollars is a lot, a lot of money. It's around at that time it was like what five hundred thousand rupees more. Even I don't have neighbors that I think my neighbor would hand me in for five hundred thousand rupees. Um, let alone what was happening in like Waziristan and the other poor areas of Pakistan where they were picking these people up. So there was a very, very aggressive um, U.S. policy to, um, you know, to hand out bounties um, for the arrest of any terrorists. And what you saw pre-Obama and in the Bush years and the heyday of. Um, renditions, you saw very little law actually being applied and picking these people up. It was done with the collusion of the Pakistani uh, authorities, who, by the way, were also collecting money. Um, the, this bounty money became um, a, a, quite a source of revenue. In fact, um, President Musharraf at that time, um, he boasts about it in his book, if the Americans think that we didn't do enough uh, on terrorism, that, you know, ask them how much money, how many millions of dollars they've had to pay us in bounties. So the Pakistani government was actively involved in um, not arresting, because that's a legal term, but actually just picking up their own people and handing them over to the Americans, who then took them on this torture tour, um, this renditions tour, um, which usually could go from Pakistan to Bagram, or, uh, you know, first to some other prison in, in Morocco where you got... Uh, you know, people interrogated and, and tortured, and then you get flown to Bagram, and then maybe you end up in Guantanamo Bay. And what you saw, well, the irony of the situation is that, you know, picking these people up and making them disappear, you saw very little law being applied. But getting them out, you are faced with an incredible amount of bureaucracy and law and international law and God knows what. Um, which becomes a real barrier to their repatriations. And that's why you see, for example, you know, Gitmo hasn't been closed. It's very difficult to repatriate people from there. And you saw the same with Bagram as well. Um, so, sorry. Um, who are these people? How did we find out about them? Um, there were some investigators um, in Pakistan who had done a lot of work to try to figure out who the current detainees uh, Pakistani detainees in Bagram were. And it was very difficult to find that out because there were no lists of the detainees in Bagram. So you had no idea. Um, they were, um, there's, there, unlike Guantanamo Bay, where the US uh, courts did assume habeas jurisdiction, in Bagram, they denied habeas. Uh, jurisdiction. So there was no way for, so the a lot of the reforms that you saw take place in Guantanamo Bay, where they were allowed to have lawyers, you did not see those happening in Bagram, which again led to this whole, uh, reinforced this concept of it was very secret, it was virtually impossible to find out who was there and what they were being held uh, against, held for, um, charged with. Um, we 
had to piece together information um, about certain people. So there was the ACLU four-year request that was done, a freedom of information request that finally released a list of names. And so that was one way for us to, um, you know, to start combing through and seeing how many of them were Pakistani. We also held a press conference a long time ago um, announcing that we were looking to um, support um, detainees and their families um, that were there in Bagram. Um, and so anybody with any information or looking for their loved ones should come to us. Uh, you know, again, uh, we looked at any of the returning detainees, some of them who were Afghan, who would then come and reach out to the families um, of Pakistani detainees because they shared a cell with them in Bagram. And, and, and they would often be the first point of contact for those detain for those families to find out that their person hadn't died that in fact he was alive and that he was you know, in this prison in Afghanistan and at which point you know, then they would go to the ICRC, the families would go to the ICRC and, uh, and try to get some um, information about it. So we pieced together a certain amount of information and we got information relating to 10 um, uh, detainees out of the 30 something that were in Bagram who were Pakistani. And using that information, we filed litigation before the Lahore High Court. Um, and in that litigation, our tactic was that we were going to sue the Pakistani government and their role in either uh, colluding with the Americans or actually capturing, abducting its own citizens and handing them over to the Americans, which then led to them, to their own citizens ending up in Bagram and this indefinite detention and this legal black hole, as we call it. Um, but the litigation was also a very good way for us to um, gain further disclosures from the Pakistani government and the US government uh, about who was there, what conditions they were being kept under, and what charges were being brought against them. And the more um, what you saw, the litigation is three years old, but what you saw in, through the litigation was um, the United States around 2010-11 had, did allow certain governments to come in and um, get consular access to the uh, detainees in Bagram. Now, the Pakistani government never asked for that access and refused to go a lot of the times. And by the way, the Americans don't call it consular access, and they still haven't been able to explain to me exactly why they can't call it consular access. Um, again, talking about law, <coughs> under the VCCR, <coughs> Excuse me. Under the Vienna Convention, that is consular access, but the U.S. does just doesn't feel like saying it's consular access, so they've denied saying it's consular access. Um, but they don't have another terminology for it. Um, and uh, so the Pakistani government never went, but under court orders in our litigation, they went and they visited the Pakistani detainees at Bagram three times in 2012, and, uh, in the period between 2012 and 2013, which is three times more than they ever went in the last ten years. Um, we also got them to release the names of the Pakistani detainees that were there and also demand from the Americans what charges these guys were being held on. And the charge sheet is, it's actually really funny because it, it isn't a charge sheet. Um, they just basically made an Excel sheet um, saying, uh, you know, detainee number this, 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 IUD manufacturer, detainee number blah, 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 IUD but you don't see any of those charges. I mean, it's uh, even the Pakistani court, uh, which is used to um, a lot of interesting, uh, you know, um, documents being presented towards them, just laughed and said, "This is not a charge sheet," um, and there's really no evidence on which you're holding these people. Um, and so the court came down very strongly on the Pakistani government saying that they were responsible um, and duty-bound to demand the repatriation of, its, of their citizens, um, and that they had to file progress reports before the court to show what stage the negotiations were at. After three years of um, fighting with the Pakistani government and the US government, we finally saw uh, eight people being released in the last 12 months. <coughs> and. The most recent of them came out in January. Um, and it's very interesting. We're still in the process of piecing together the information about what actually happened and why they were being held. But to, just to give you an idea of who ends up there and who these people are and how do you, you know, is it being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or, you know, how do you end up in Bagram? And what you see is a whole array of stories. I mean, you see all kinds of people. You see the very poor, the very marginalized, the very disenfranchised uh, 
people, um, some of whom are mentally ill. Um, there's one uh, person who came out and he, he was visiting, he was a young boy, um, you know, he was in his uh, late teens and he was visiting his father in the hospital in Peshawar, who his father was quite ill and he had taken him there for treatment. And because his father was there for a, for a very long time, um, he was visiting his dad all the time and in the hospital bed next to his father, there were some Afghans from Jalalabad who had come also seeking treatment in, in Pakistan and, as, and who were also at the same age. And as these boys would hang out, you know, this was around the time of summer vacations, these guys would, uh, the Afghan guys would talk to the Pakistani guy about, you know, how beautiful Jalalabad was and there were all these trees and mountain areas and, and so the Pakistani boy was really, really um, taken by the beauty of, uh, you know, the stories that these guys were saying. And these are, you know, these are kids who've just finished high school. Uh, you know, they're in a lull between before going to start work or uh, pursue further education. And so he decides to go on like a four day trip to Jalalabad, you know, with these Afghans who he's been seeing for, a, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks now, um, just for the weekend to go to Jalalabad. And they cross into Afghanistan uh, with their Afghan hosts in a car. And on the way back, they're picked up. Um, the Afghans has actually sold him and he was traded for a bounty. So the Afghans pocketed a nice amount of money and this guy got to go to Bagram. Um, <clears throat> there are other stories of people who work. There's another guy who came out and he was a construction, um, he constructed houses, he was a contractor. And uh, he did really good work. And there's a lot of Afghans, again, in in, in uh, Peshawar and, um, he really liked the work that, you know, this other Pakistani was doing as a, as a contractor and he asked him to come over and work on his house. So he was in Afghanistan working on this guy's house and again, what you see is him being, uh, you know, just out of the blue being sold into Afghan custody. Um, we've also found people, two of them were very old, they were, you know, well not very old, but quite old in their 60s, who were drug addicts. Um, they had gone as poor laborers. They'd been shunned by their village in Pakistan for being drug addicts and uh, shunned by their families. Um, they then drifted, um, trying to do some uh, small labor. Um, and again, you have to understand that for Pashtuns and for people who live in the northwestern province, the Khyber Pashtun province, the border is quite porous between Afghanistan and Pakistan. I mean. A lot of them don't even, if you ask them, they won't even tell you where the border is. People who live in that area, because it's just so common for them to be crossing over for, you know, day's labor or whatever. Uh, and you saw these two guys who were drug addicts, you know, crossing over at some point and then being picked up in an Afghan drug den. And we're not talking like a big drug den. I mean, this is where they went to smoke opium or whatever. Um, and then, you know, the next thing they know, they end up in Bagram. Um, and they spend actually eight years there. <laughs> um, it was really interesting when they came out, uh, the Americans actually said to me like, oh, well, we essentially put them through rehab. <laughs> um, and I thought, right, okay, well, that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, first they said they didn't know, but then they said, oh, well, we couldn't have hurt them that much. It was actually good for them. They got to go through rehab. Um, you also saw other people who were um, traveling from... Uh, sorry, from Pish again, uh, the northwestern province, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, down to the uh, south, um, looking for medical treatment for one of, um, there's these two guys together, best friends. Again, they were around 17, 18 at that time. One of them suffered from epileptic strokes. Um, so they were looking for treatment for a medicine man. They, they, they traveled down to Quetta. At Quetta, they find out, no, the medicine man has actually moved to Chaman, which is right across the border. It's not that far. They cross into Chaman. They're in a market. Um, they go into a shop to ask about this medical man, and they find out that next thing they know, they're surrounded by people and um, uh, take it to Bagram again. So that's really kind of an idea of the kind of people that are um, there. There's never been, what happens to them when they come back? Um, to Pakistan, well, this is something that's being worked out right now between the Americans and the Pakistanis. And what we're seeing is that the Pakistanis are kind of learning um, their craft from the Americans. So all the, there's security and humanitarian assurances that need to be negotiated before somebody can come out of Bagram. So getting them into Bagram is super easy. 
Um, there's no law, there's no review of that action. They can hold them for ages, have no evidence against them whatsoever. In fact, a lot of the ones that they had evidence, so the charges that said, oh, IED manufacturer, we were actually able to demonstrate to the court that they had a history of mental illness and they can't even string two words together, let alone build a bomb. Um, but getting them out is mired in bureaucracy um, and it, that begins with securing humanitarian and security assurances from the country that's going to repatriate them. And what we're seeing is that the security assurances is where the Americans are really kind of putting their foot down and saying, we want assurances from the Pakistanis that you're going to hold them um, on such and such charges. And then the Pakistanis turn around and say, well, you need to give us some evidence. Um, and the Americans are not willing to share that evidence, but they want a commitment from the Pakistanis that they're going to be holding them. But what's happening now is that with the US withdrawal, I'm going to finish up right after this one, with the US withdrawal from Afghanistan that's impending, the focus is going to shift to Pakistan. And what you've seen is Pakistan taking really pages and pages and pages out of uh, the American law book, on, um, for example, the Patriot Act and stuff, and expanding their own laws um, in the form of these ordinances that are not even passed by parliament, but passed by the president that grant wide powers of um, preventative detention. Um, so we have the Pakistan Protection Ordinance, which allows you to be detained for 90 days. Um, you know, they're really going down that visa uh, Snowden route. They don't even need to show any kind of um, sus reasonable suspicion on which they're keeping you. You don't have a right to see any of the, uh, uh, you know, the evidence against you. Even the judges can't see that. So, I mean, it's getting, and, and so what they're doing is that they're going to be repatriating these guys and holding them under these, uh, you know, more and more draconian and secret laws that is just going to allow them to be repatriated back into this other hellhole where they're just going to be lost into the system. And I'm sure I can answer some questions about that later on. Sorry. Thank you, Sagar. <laughs> Yeah, obviously for any of our speakers, um, people should feel free to pick up uh, whatever thread um, they like in the Q&A. Um, and I'm sure the speakers themselves would like to add on to things they've said. Um, so next up is Madiha. Um, I'd actually like to, so I'm, hi, I'm a writer and filmmaker. I just did a short documentary called Wounds of Waziristan, which came out in the fall, that actually interviews survivors and families of the dead of drone attacks in Pakistan. And I wanted to do two things. First, I want to just show you a trailer for the documentary. And secondly, um, I want to, the second clip I'm going to show, because I don't want to turn off the lights and turn them on and talk. So let me just tell you what the second clip is. The second clip is um, a video that we did for one of the subjects in my documentary. His name is Karim Khan. He was picked up and disappeared on February 5th. Yeah. Um, and so we did this video um, as a kind of part of a broader campaign to get him released. He, he was released um, on February 14th. But um, I'll just leave it there, and then I can talk to you about it afterwards. Yes, I'm there for you. There's a box right there. You can just turn down the light. U.S. strikes have resulted in civilian casualties. For me and those in my chain of command, those deaths will haunt us as long as we live. So the story isn't so much about the dead. It's the way they haunt the living. The way they linger. The way they hang on. What does it mean to be haunted by loss? Pakistan in 2004. 
Now it's nine years later, and the American conversation on drone attacks is only just beginning. What we do now is we find out someone having a Big Mac in Islamabad, they're out of here. And it's quite clear that civilians being killed in Pakistan, including large numbers of children historically, have been labelled as militants by the CIA. That makes no sense and certainly uh, is not what you would expect under, the, for example, the Geneva Conventions, laws of war and international human rights law. Well, the CIA says it's killed no more than 60 civilians in eight, eight years of bombing. Well, we've identified 175 children killed in that period. So the debate, the fight, if you like, is over who is being killed. Just don't hide it, the camera don't hide it. Greatest terrorist of the world is the United States. हम अभी किसे अपना गिला कर रहे हैं किसके सामने हम रोए किसे इंसाफ की तोको रखे anti-drone activist and journalist has gone missing in Pakistan just days before he was due to travel to Europe to speak with parliament members about the impact of the U.S. drone wars. The legal charity Reprieve says Kareem Khan was seized in the early hours of February 5th by up to 20 men, some wearing police uniforms. He has not been seen since. He told his story in the recent documentary, Wounds of Waziristan. <laughs> गर हुजरे के ऊपर ड्रोन काटे को गिर गए जिसमें मेरे भाई और बेटे शहीद हो गए जिनके पास ड्रोन जैसे महल का हथियार है ड्रोन जैसे महल का वो मिसाइल हमारे ऊपर अपने घरों के अंदर बरसा रहा है मेरे ख्याल में इससे बड़ा जलजल कोई नहीं है He's become the latest statistic among the dozens of people missing in Pakistan. For simply for wanting to speak out about what happened to him and what is happening and continues to happen in that area, um, he has been disappeared by the Pakistani state. As I said, on February 14th, Karim Khan was um, released. Um, for eight days, he was held in a basement somewhere in Islamabad. He was blindfolded. He was held. Um, he was hung upside down and beaten. Um, his captors wanted to know more about his anti-drone work. They wanted to know who he knew in North Waziristan, which is where he's from and uh, originally. Um, his family and he recently moved to uh, Raul Pindi, closer to the capital of the country, Islamabad, which is from where he was picked up. Um, the reason I wanted to show the second video is that, um, you know, while he was being held, there was a campaign that began for his release, and that campaign included lawyers on the ground, um, including his lawyer, Shahzad Akbar, who filed a habeas corpus on his behalf, lawyers in the UK, um, European parliamentarians who wrote uh, letters on his be behalf demanding his release, activists in DC from Code Pink and other organizations um, who did a protest and also organized a petition for his release, um, and finally an online social media campaign of which this video was a part, including there was also a Tumblr and Twitter uh, campaign. It's hard to say why his captors let him go after only eight days. Um, I say only because 
Um, as you've heard from Sara, um, you know, thousands of Pakistanis have been disappeared in Pakistan, and most of them are never found. Um, in Balochistan, I had the privilege of meeting a few people who had been held. They had been held for many, many months, had been tortured, and finally released, partly, um, I think, to spread terror and confusion in the communities in which they go, uh, to which they go back to. Um, so, you know, in that context, Karim was only released after eight days, and it's difficult to say what, if anything, contributed to his release, and we may never know. But given the history and the way that disappearances usually work in Pakistan, it seems that this campaign, which involved everything from lawyers to activists um, to online campaigns, had something to do with it. So in that regard, I think maybe perhaps we can call this as the only successful campaign related to drone attacks in the last decade in Pakistan. And I think part of that success probably rests in the ease of the demand. Um, asking for the release of a person is relatively easier, um, <laughs> although you've just heard about the difficulties. But perhaps it sounds a little more doable than asking for an end to a policy of drone attacks. Um, my other hunch, though, is this, that this was a campaign that included lawyers, but it was not a campaign that was led by lawyers. Um, and that's a lot of what's been happening, actually, in the last decade, is that most of the discourse and discussion around drones has been um, in the context of uh, a legal framework. And by legal framework, I don't mean the specific cases that Sarah is working on, that Shahzad is working on, because in those cases, they are asking for the release of specific people. I am actually talking about international law, which means international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Um, because in the context of international law, there's actually not a court to adjudicate any of these issues. It is basically a question of consensus and a question of uh, legitimacy. Um, so in that context, I think, you know, we've been having these discussions um, about the law, and it's become, as I've said many times before, it's become confused with morality, and it's become indistinguishable from the, from the moral and ethical question about American militarism. Um, and, you know, in, in this um, a kind of talk, we take the law as morality, and that orients us to a particular view of the world. So over the last decade or so, as American drone attacks have expanded to several countries, major human rights organizations have abjured uh, from taking a clear position on the bombings, instead demanding more disclosure from the U.S. government so that legal questions can be addressed. In the meantime, the U.S. has bombed and bombed again. Um, it's bombed wedding parties, um, thinking of them and mutating them into al-Qaeda convoys. Um, it's bombed uh, milit you know, what it calls military-age males, essentially teenage boys, who happen to get caught in a strike zone and are then listed as militants. The human rights movement defers adjudication till the, some future date when they will have all the requisite information that they need. In the meantime, Yemenis, Somalis, Afghans, Pakistanis endure the present. The victims and their international advocates live in different time zones. They live in different time frames. One set is snarled in legal discussions, and the other side endures. The interesting point about whether drone attacks are legal or not is why we ask this question at all. First of all, it's not that we always are asking this question explicitly, but it is implicitly there and with incredible regularity that it has come to form the backdrop of most of our conversations on the subject. Most of the time, most of the stories and discussions on drones are answering this question, are drones legal? Um, it is as though we had all implicitly agreed that resolving the intricate legal puzzles around drone warfare will naturally settle the rather more onerous moral quandary about taking life and the political question about American militarism. Now, the difference between law and morality is evident in domestic politics. Um, so, for example, if you take the case of um, George Zimmerman, while many progressives have argued that it may be difficult to prove that Zimmerman violated Florida's now notorious stand your ground law, that does not lead them to conclude that Trayvon, murdering Trayvon Martin was moral. The conclusion that progressives draw from the Zimmerman trial is the opposite, that Florida's stand your ground law is immoral. 
Yet, mainstream media and analysts jettison that crucial distinction between law and morality when it comes to American militarism. Whether ex explicitly or implicitly, the legal question underwrites a host of narrative maneuvers, and this is very true of mainstream journalism in the United States. There's an overriding um, cat, uh, concern with, I would almost say a fetish, um, making a fetish of uh, categorization. So categorizing the dead as either civilians or militants. Um, and an almost exclusive focus on questions of transparency and disclosure. These are critical questions, but when the media deploys them as the dominant frame through which to understand US militarism, it renders significant political issues invisible. Um, today, I think, in what passes for serious conversation, it is considered almost puerile to query the American will to empire or to wonder on what moral authority the US has taken to occupying and policing the world. You cannot ask this question in mainstream America. It seems that we cannot think outside of legal categories, and that is a disturbing sign to me of a depressing, shriveled political imagination. It is not accidental that the military, the US military, is fond of proclaiming that lawyers are present to ratify each drone attack. Without a broader political discussion and in the absence of a strong movement to ground legal work, law and effective military strategy can become almost indistinguishable. Consider, for example, General Stanley McChrystal's latest comments in which he cautioned against the use of drones, even as he called them, quote, effective tools. This candid assessment is only the latest in a string of statements that McChrystal has issued since at least 2012, urging a more careful drone policy. Coming from a general whose tenure as the head of US Special Operations Command was marked by a sharp escalation of drone attacks on Afghanistan, the comments have reverberated through the media. He has been called a critic of drone policy, even an unlikely opponent. His simultaneous call to increase the use of drones, coupled with his admonishing remarks about such warfare, warfare have been called, quote, a complicated love affair with drones, end quote. Yet, General McChrystal's comments signify neither correction nor discomfiture with the policies he helped promulgate. They are rather the entirely predictable result of an intelligent military general who is making a considered strategic evaluation. And the evaluation is the following. Winning a war is made harder by killing or seeming to kill willy-nilly because it provokes a backlash. This is how coin works, winning hearts and minds. So for the US military to be effective in bringing about a victory, whatever that victory may be or however it may be defined, its violence should appear rational and justified. As the Israeli scholar E.L. Wiseman has, ob has observed, the minimization of violence is therefore both a humanitarian demand, it's what we call for as, um, it's what human rights discourse has been calling for in the United States. It's both uh, a humanitarian demand and good military strategy. The postures that humanitarian law takes in these instances to condemn specific instances of excessive force actually work to legitimize an overall acceptable level of violence, right? So the focus is on the collateral damage that has happened and not on questioning the broader political framework that actually gives the United States the right to, 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 uh, to go forward with such a policy to occupy and police, police the world. This is what Wiseman has called the humanitarian present. In this humanitarian present, the law is in the service of abandonment. And by that I mean that the law is, being, is part of a rhetoric in which the people who actually live in the tribal areas, who deal on a daily basis with the attacks, in particular in North Waziristan and South Waziristan, where the majority of the attacks have been happening, um, they're not part of the discussion in any real sense, except occasionally being brought up as as victims. The real discussion that is happening is one about legal principles and legal questions and about the legalization of violence, not about ending violence. Um, so when a more capacious political conversation is lacking, the more conservative aspects of the law come to frame our understanding of this issue. And consequently, I think the media misreads calls for efficient war practices, like General McChrystal's, as anti-war critiques. 
The medium thus muddles the distinctions between the political left and the political right. It makes a fetish of counting and categorizing civilian or militant, human rights law or humanitarian law, they're two different bodies of law, to the exclusion of other questions that may trouble these categories. In this situation, how does the law orient us to hear people's stories? Um, well, for one, as I said, um, we ask questions trying to figure out if person X is a civilian or a militant. We become interested in those categories. We become oriented towards a juridical view of other people's stories. We don't listen to what people are trying to tell us. Rather, we listen with suspicion to ferret out who is a real victim and who is not, and just how many, to separate the truth from the lies. The ideology of objectivity that is so prevalent in American journalism further exacerbates this issue. And so in this context, we have a conflation and a series. It's law equals morality um, and, uh, and categorization. So law, math, ethics, right? Because math in the sense of how, you know, proportionality, how many people have we killed? Have we killed too many? Have we killed too few? Um, so what are our options? Uh, and I, and I want to start with a, a quote. I think one of the things is to actually begin to hear people's stories and begin to hear them on their own terms. Um, but there are different ways that, he, that hearing can happen and how we can un begin to understand the testimony of, um, uh, of people who have survived and continue to endure uh, drone attacks. Charles Reznikoff um, published a, uh, a, a volume called Testimony, the U.S. in 1978. And it's, uh, what it is is it's a book of short um, poem, sentence, uh, poem sentence extractions from courtroom witness statements. And he turned those extractions into sort of short poems. And um, uh, Reznikoff... Uh, uh, sorry, Charles Bernstein, who's a, cr who's a critic, reading this uh, volume, said, quote, the acknowledgement of these peripheral stories turns a wasteland into holy ground, end quote. So that's the task. It's how do we turn this wasteland and what we have come to perceive as a wasteland um, into holy ground, into something sacred, into something worth thinking about and holding up. So in order to think about that task, um, I, uh, I would say I, 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 have no <laughs> I have no answers to that, but I have some thoughts. Um, I think taking that task seriously would mean um, understanding, getting beyond the questions of civilian and militant, to actually thinking about the relationships on the ground. Karim Khan, for example, his son and his brother were killed in an attack uh, in December 2009 on New Year's Eve. Um, you know, the question of whether there were militants there or not, or whether these people are militants, it's, you know, there's enough evidence on the one hand to say otherwise. But the fact that we even have to ask that question, as if that is the only relevant question, I think speaks to the problem. Um, another way I think to think about it is, um, and here I'm drawing on Talal Assad, who is an anthropologist actually here at, at CUNY. Um, he talks about the question of translation. Um, and what he says is that all good translation seeks to reproduce the structure of an alien discourse within the translator's own language, end quote. In other words, the task is not for us to produce Karim Khan as somebody like us, but to understand his world on his terms. And I think that is the difference between a human rights discourse and an anti-imperial discourse. One, the human rights discourse is largely able to understand these people only as victims. And then we are busy looking for innocent victims, the perfect victim um, who, can, who we can hold up as you know, the, the, the exemplar of what's wrong with this policy. The other discourse, the anti-imperial discourse, is about understanding the, the politics of American militarism and understanding these people on their own terms. We don't have to necessarily agree with everything, but we have to understand and excavate the politics behind it. So I think I'll just stop there. Thank you, Badihan. That brings us to our um, 
last speaker. I hate going Asim. last, by the way. Yeah? I have like nothing left to say. <laughs> That's not true. Um, Asim always has lots to say. <laughs> Well, I, I'm at least, I, I was familiar with the panelists to the extent that I know their work. Uh, so I was sort of prepared. I prepared a lot of nice formal talk, but I'm a little bit tired uh, having flown in from Africa like a couple of hours ago. And uh, so I'm actually not going to stick with my formal talk and just kind of uh, make it a little bit less, less formal. Let's see if this thing comes up. Um, I, am a, I am a photographer by profession, and I've been working on a project in Pakistan looking at questions of law and justice in Pakistan. The project is called Law and Disorder. Um, I wanted to talk originally about the project, but if you take anything away from my one talk, you should take away the fact that photographers are incredibly boring people to listen to, particularly when they talk about their projects and their photographs, so just as a future reference. So I'm actually not going to talk so much about the project, but I'll talk a little bit more about where it comes from and, and in a way sort of talk more about Pakistan. We've heard actually a lot about Pakistan uh, and about Pakistanis actually. If I'm not mistaken, uh, after 9-11, the Pakistanis are the highest number of people deported or detained um, in the sweeps that occurred after 9-11. And then of course, Pakistan is also where most of the men who were trawled into Guantanamo and Bagram were bought and sold. I think nearly 82% uh, according to the Seton Hall report, of the men who were found in Guantanamo were sold, um, either picked up by, in Pakistan or by Northern Alliance forces in Pakistan. So uh, unfortunately, Pakistan gets a lot of uh, attention. But the question, and of course, this, is a, this has affected how journalists work in, uh, in Pakistan. And so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about, about Pakistan and then through that, I'll just talk a little bit about this project I'm working on and how I'm working on it uh, and the problems that I'm trying to address. Now, it is a work in progress. So unlike uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Arun, who's finished this lovely book, which I actually am really like, looking forward to read, and Madhya, who's finished a film, and Sara, who's gotten people out of jail, I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm, on, I'm on a work in progress. Uh, and <laughs> I haven't uh, finished anything. But So let me start. Um, I wanted to start with uh, a story. I wanted to show you a couple of things. Uh, this is an image from October 13, 2009. Our esteemed Air Chief Marshal, Kamar Suleiman, uh, has just paid um, $2 billion to receive uh, a set of very fancy uh, war planes. And he's so proud standing there. Uh, this was a big news item. Unfortunately, I can't find it again on, on the internet, but I'm sure you can, you can find it. Uh, this item came out on October 13, 2009. And right next to that, a few days later, is another story, which was actually on the back page of a different newspaper. And that was published on October 22, 2009, um, which is a story of a, of a mother who committed suicide uh, along with her three children. She killed her three children. And I, uh, I'm putting this point up there that if you want to understand Pakistan, uh, you can uh, pretty much understand it by just connecting the dots between these two stories. It's actually not that much more complicated than that. And it's actually a pretty good way to start to think about um, what is happening in the country in terms of law, in terms of justice, in terms of some of the pathologies that we do hear about in the newspaper. Uh, but what you will typically see is that we actually don't get a lot of reporting that connects these two dots. But, the, but these two incidences are connected. The fact that we have people in Pakistan who have nothing to eat, and the fact that we also possess these very uh, impressive, oops, sorry, the screen is sort of smaller, these very impressive weapons, and that we are buying more. And for somehow we figured out, we, we managed to find all that kind of money to pay for these aircrafts. And by the way, we just also happen to be a country that signed a new IMF deal, I believe, in February, in January, um, 
for another few millions of dollars. And we also signed a new defense pact with the Americans in December 2013. Um, so the challenge for a report, and I covered Pakistan for uh, a few magazines, a bunch of American magazines, uh, for a few years before I stopped working for them. Uh, and I've been working on this project on my own. And the challenge has been, that, well, how do you talk about Pakistan? How do you talk about a country that actually has become an issue? And no matter what you try and do, it will always be seen through that issue, and the war, that issue now being the war against terror. That's been the principal challenge. Uh, and I was reminded of something that Edwin Dantikat, who the Haitian writer, once wrote. Uh, and she talked about the fact that when the country becomes an issue, uh, it poses a problem for an artist because everything or anything that the artist would produce or the writer would produce will always be seen from that perspective of that issue. And she argued that what really matters in the end uh, is an adherence to the singular experience. And in that, in a book, uh, I can't remember the name of the book, actually. I think I do have the quotes, but uh, in a book, Sorry, it's all my notes that I have to pull together. Uh, create dangerously. Um, she, she wrote this line to her daughter. So as I write uh, this to you now, Sophie, as I write it to myself, praying that the singularity of your experience be allowed to exist. Uh, so this is my, this is my project. Uh, it's called Law and Disorder. And the concept behind the project is that it is based on a series of 350 stories. That's where it will technically finish. Over the course of three years, I'm collecting 350 individual narratives, individual lives that are the starting point of trying to understand what is actually happening in Pakistan. Uh, the way this project actually uh, works, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few seconds, but um, there are a few other things I wanted to show you. Um, I also want to show you some, how much actually things haven't changed. This is an old quote from Iqbal Ahmed, uh, the Pakistani intellectual who's a professor at Hampshire College, I believe. And I think this quote dates to somewhere in the mid-1980s, if not earlier. Uh, there is an increasingly perceptible gap between our need for social transformation and America's insistence on stability, between our impatience for change and America's obsession with order, and our move towards revolution in America's belief in the plausibility of achieving reforms under the robber barons of the third world, our longing for absolute national sovereignty in America's preference for pliable allies, our desires to see our national soil free of foreign occupation, and America's alleged need for military bases. Very little has changed. 9-11 was not the start of anything new. It's actually just been a series of continuities, and we see the same thing today. So, Many people are trying to understand Pakistan today through new lenses, which actually one could argue uh, are not needed. Uh, there are plenty of old lenses that you can continue to see. What has happened in the aftermath of 9-11 is actually a continuation of a lot of very old policies and a lot of very old struggles uh, that the country has been involved in. Uh, which then brings me to this question of um, struggles. But right, I'll, just, I'll come back to that in a couple of seconds. Uh, so the project called Law and Disorder, um, and Sarah and I worked on one major portion of the project, which was on the stories about, of the Bagram prisoners. The question was that we actually have no information on about these men in terms of what has happened to them, uh, why they were picked up, what is happening to them in Bagram. But we decided that what, we, what would actually be really interesting to do would be to go and speak to their families and in a way use those stories to complete the narratives of the men and and what has happened to their families as a consequence of their imprisonment. Um, the project, however, um, at the, so far has covered uh, about nine different uh, chapters, and some of them are still works in progress. And what that means is that a work in progress is basically my way of saying, I've actually gone out, done the interviews, and taken photographs, but I have to actually write everything that must now sit behind it, and that's just taking a lot longer. Uh, to do. Actually, even in the completed chapters, I'm only 30% done. So if you look at chapters under garment factory workers, for example, that they are largely incomplete. But the Bagram Prisoners Campaign was a concentrated effort. We took about three months in the field and another month and a half to do the writing. And I've actually spent another two months with the law, in the early part of this year to add more details to it. Um, but unlike journalistic projects um, where 
we struggle to sort of connect history with person narrative, with sort of the breaking news. Uh, this project works at many different levels. So um, at the first uh, level, the project is, is on Instagram. And so the project it, itself is being followed through this page and a second page with links through my own site by over about 31,000 people. Uh, now, of course, we can challenge those numbers, and I won't get into a debate about sort of the, some of the fraudulence of likes and so on. But uh, what happens with, with this community, and there are various communities, what's happening with this community is that this is a pro this, these photographs are sort of my field diaries, and they actually document the process of working in the field in Pakistan and what it takes to get something done. So they're not idealized representations of a journalist coming back and simply reporting the facts. They're actually um, very personal notes that I collected while I was waiting to do things. And they sort of put me in the midst of the creation of this project. So by look, following my work on Instagram, you can actually follow me into Pakistan you can follow me into the issues, the problems, the prejudices, the class divisions, the struggles to talk to women, the, 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 the problems I have in you know, trying to locate the families. Everything is there. It's just sort of put out there. The mistakes, the stupid questions I ask, which I later on edit into a fine sound, you know, sounding article, all that stuff is actually here. And so you, this is sort of the easiest place to begin uh, to follow the work. Now, I haven't figured out a way to connect this to the broad website, but we're actually also trying to work on that. Once you go into the main <coughs> website of the project, uh, where the focus becomes the individual stories, uh, you will be able to read uh, a testimony which is based on my meeting with the particular subject. Now, these are conversations we've had with them about, for example, their relative who is in Bagram. In this case, uh, this is Mohammed Isaac, is the brother of prisoner 1897, Fazl Karim. And it's a way for me to go and speak to him about his brother, his brother's life, background, aspirations, dreams, what their story is about how, they, uh, how he may have ended up in prison. But now we could leave it at that, right? That's sort of where you could leave a magazine story or you could leave a magazine piece. And what happens is that you sort of lose the thread of how we've sort of ended up here. So what we've done is that we've actually activated the photograph one additional level. Um, and these active buttons actually travel with different portraits. So if you go through, there are about 30, 41 stories from Bagram at the moment. And as you follow through them, each one of these active points works off the text or the comment the family member may have made. So for example, I am struggling to get people to understand the brutality of force feeding. It's been impossible to get people to understand that at this very moment, people are being tortured in Guantanamo, no matter what the government says, because even force feeding is a form of brutal torture. And it's designed and performed in a way to be painful, to be humiliating, and to be brutal. So how do you do that? I can't write a separate essay. I could. But it will not actually be that interesting. So what happens is that if, the, if, a, if a, a particular individual will you know, in the testimony say something that I can latch on to, then we actually connect, I will actually connect um, his sentences to a discussion about um, force, uh, hunger strikes and force feeding. So for example, here, you can actually bring up that and read about what, it, you know, what, what a hunger strike is, how people are force fed, and not only that, but you can actually click on it and go one step further and just actually go to a web page where we can read about it in more detail. So this is a link to a open society report on the practice of torture. And you can basically download the report just having sort of worked you through a testimony and connecting you to the broader um, issues that surround the lives of all of these prisoners. So as you go through each, uh, you can learn about the prisoner himself. So for example, who is prisoner? Uh, 1897 Fazl Karim, this is his story. This is how he ended up in Bagram. Uh, in some of the other cases, I have links to photographs from their homes. We have links to audio recordings of them reading letters, uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that you never have to kind of let all of this go, because this stuff sort of travels with you. So just because we're not talking about hunger strikes anymore doesn't mean that they're over. Or just because we're not talking about torture in Bagram doesn't mean that if we get evidence from Guantanamo, that doesn't apply. I'm just trying to sort of create this sort of 
set of information that constantly travels around these uh, testimonies. Um, Karim Khan was, this actually, the reason why the story came up recently was because when you update one of the testimonies, they automatically move to the front of the website. So Karim Khan, as, as uh, Madi had just mentioned, was uh, disappeared and uh, I needed to quickly update um, that story, quickly, quickly update the you know, people who are following this project. So here you can, for example, see where Karim Khan's, the, the drone strike took place. You can get details about the particular strike we're talking about. Um, as he talks about his experience, as he talks to me, he had a very contentious discussion with me. Um, and he's a very gentle and polite individual, but at the same time, he is uh, very, very intelligent. And, uh, and in, I guess and sometimes you feel that he's kind of mocking you because you know, he's, like, or just, he's just waiting for you to ask him something. But anyhow, as he talks, we can use his line, you know, his, his statements to learn more about drone strikes. So, you know, this whole issue that Maria talked about, you know, are drone strikes legal and international law? Why well, we keep getting these new reports, blah, blah, blah. And I want to like keep track of those things so that we're not getting lost in the weeds of all these new reports coming out. Um, and uh, I believe precision weapons. So here we can, you know, we, we talk about the whole, how the measure, you know, all this debates we had a few months ago about drone accuracy, suddenly we're not talking about those anymore. I don't want to lose sight of those discussions. They're still relevant and they keep coming up. And as these testimonies come out or, or these people say things, you think about these things. I'm sitting in this room and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about these things. His son died um, and I'm thinking about, you know, how accurate was that drone? Because, you know, Brennan keeps telling me they're the most accurate weapons ever. Um, so, when, so when we had just updated with the campaign came out, uh, this one talks about uh, the fact that he was picked up and disappeared. So, you know, this project, you kind of, it keeps updating you. So as I read things, as I add things to a particular testimony, then these things can keep uh, getting added on. Um, this is Amanatullah. Again, this is another, this is a brother of another uh, prisoner and so on. So as you can see, uh, again, these things, and they're not, they're not all going to be the same. So they will be different ones. So here we, we can talk about Bagram. Uh, there's a sweet irony in the fact that Bagram was actually built by the Russians. Um, you know, I find that uh, interesting. And I think there's something rich to be written about the American takeover of Bagram and Afghanistan and, you know, all the messes that we got into and sort of go back into, into that history. And another thing, uh, um, you know, where does that reputation come from? You know, we tend not to ask that, but families are really worried about what has happened to their, you know, to their sons or husbands in Bagram because they hear things. They hear things that may not be in a report because we don't get anything out of Bagram, but ex-prisoners come and tell them things uh, and so on. So. How much time do I have? Sorry. Um, so I'm not. So basically, the the project is online. You can actually go into it. You can just follow the links. It's covering a lot. I mean, the Bagram prison campaign is one part of a number of questions we're asking about Pakistan and about law and justice. And what I'm trying to do um, in the project is what I talked about earlier, which is connect the dots. Too many people handle or view Pakistan as some kind of a singular pathology that fell out of space and arrived at the current moment as it is. But what I'm trying to do is to get you to see through individual stories and individual lives that Pakistan today is a result of some very specific and concrete choices that we as a country, as a citizenry or what have you, have made. And just as we made these choices in the past, we can decide not to make them in the future. But we, as whether we are journalists reporting on Pakistan or whether we are Pakistanis looking at our own country or as Americans looking at Pakistan and trying to figure out what is, what's happening, have to start to see it as a country with autonomous, sovereign individuals who are facing certain experiences that we should be recording and understanding, and a country that is making specific political and economic choices that gets it into the kinds of problems that it is at the moment. So for example, we, as I was mentioning earlier, we have signed a new defense agreement with the Americans, and we have signed a new loan agreement with the IMF. And that should tell you a lot about Pakistan's seriousness about anti-drone statements. So you can quickly, you don't have to wait for a report or a human rights organization to tell you or for Sharif to admit that you know, we're lying. You can just look at the fact that structurally we are so embedded 
deep in, in our relationship with the Americans that it doesn't matter whether we block traffic out of Peshawar for a few NATO supplies when we're signing multi-billion dollar deals to continue to collaborate with you. If you read the statement of the defense pack, it's fantastic about shared ideals and shared goals and way into the future we'll be working together and so on and so forth. So this is the kind of stuff you typically will not see in a newspaper that I'm trying to basically get here and connect in, in a project like this and through stories. I'll just use one more, which is actually a work in progress, um, which uh, is Abdul Ghaffar. Okay, so this is a story, this, these are a series of stories I've done on garment factory workers. And uh, Abdul Ghaffar is somebody, again, which goes back to Pakistan and poverty. And a lot of people ask, us, ask me about you know, why there's so many slums in Karachi and so on and so forth. Uh, Abdul Ghaffar is one of those slum dwellers. He moved in from the rural areas to Karachi. And he said something to me, which actually is probably a thesis in itself. When I asked him why he left his job in the um, middle of sin and, and was forced to move to Karachi, he said, because he felt ill. And so what do you mean? He said, well, I fell ill because I used to work in a textile factory and I got a lung disease. So what happens is that there's this fine powder that's produced as a result of the textiles that they, they work in and it kind of tears at your lungs as you breathe it in. And after a few years, you basically are unable to breathe on your own and you become useless. And uh, your, uh, your employer can just basically let you go. You're done. Thank you very much for your services. And then people like him drift to cities. And the question that I wanted to ask was, why do we allow that to happen? Because Pakistan is a signatory of every single ILO labor um, agreement law in the world, every single one, maybe 10 times over. And we have also fantastic laws on paper. And yet, this is what actually happens. And the answer is in specific political choices that we have made. It's not in some moral callousness or anything. It's in specific calculations that were made by the Sindh government or, or Punjab government at a certain period in time with a certain commitment to a certain economic vision for the country that, for example, factory inspections were removed and inspectors were had their cars taken away or labor laws were destroyed or people were just told, don't worry about it, we're not going to enforce anything in terms of you know, your welfare commitments and so on and so forth. So those specific choices are what I'm going to try and bring back through these individual experiences to help people understand that it's not as if this country and the people in this country are not fighting for certain things. It's just that the way we continue to report it, you tend to erase all those voices. Um, my last example, let me see if I can find it, um, is this photograph, uh, which I, I am sure nobody will recognize except Sarah, who's seen it before, but nobody will have any idea what this photograph is. I'm not bringing it up further because there's a caption underneath. Uh, but in 2008, uh, this photograph captures the, probably the high point culmination of one of the largest uh, citizens mass movement in the country, which is the landless peasant movement out of Punjab. Okay, um, when this is in 2008, Abdul Sattar, who is one of the leaders of that movement, ran for the provincial assembly seat in Punjab, and he lost to the incumbent feudal landlord with, who actually had huge contacts in the military by a mere 3,000 votes. And this, these statistics are on the internet. Um, this community of illiterate and some of the most poorest, most exploited laborers, land workers in the country managed to put to, pull together an incredible democratic miracle. Uh, and not a single Pakistani newspaper reported it. Uh, in 2004, the Washington Post wrote a story, but that was because the army was killing these people back then. Um, there are dozens and dozens of such movements in the country, and dozens and dozens of people, many who are in prison because on, on anti-terrorism charges, um, who have been resisting the state and fighting for social and economic justice in Pakistan. And the and I'm going to quote Sadia because this whole obsession with the jihadis is just a fabulous way to distract the fact that what Pakistanis are actually fighting for is anything but that. And these are the movements which will not make it into the newspaper. These are the guys that you will not see. And these are the stories that you have to begin to tell if you're going to in some way, shape, or form try to understand what is actually happening in Pakistan, what is being, you know, who is being used, what are the narratives that are being spread. 
and, and why they are being spread. I'll do is this, I'll see how many people wish to speak or ask questions, and if there's a whole bunch, we'll take maybe two or three um, at a time. And if there's only one or two, then we can take them. Anyone else? Or okay, so we have two. So um, you, sir, and then you. Okay. I have three questions. Can you can you speak up a little? I'm yeah, sorry, I have, we don't I seem have to have questions, one. so I'd like to run down. Um, the first one is about um, Theresa May in England. Uh, I think she's the Home Secretary. She's been engaging in a process known as citizenship stripping. Um, and I've been wondering how that's affecting foreign terror, seeing as the UK and US are kind of partners in this. Um, second, recently, the judge, uh, there was a judge who threw out, um, or I, I can't remember the actual ruling, but essentially it was a xenophobic ruling on basically the, the NYPD's. Um, surveillance program within the city um, and basically said that Muslims who wouldn't otherwise be harmed if the AP hadn't revealed this program because they didn't know about it. Essentially saying that it was okay to do that. So uh, reflections, thoughts on that. And the third question, um, I saw in the news the other, just I think today, that basically um, the Pakistan state is now uh, attacking the places that US drones have attacked before within the last day with their own fighters, so I was wondering um, just kind of that state collaboration and reflections on that. So um, did you want to go ahead and ask your question too? Um, okay, so okay, so we'll go around and then I'll come back to you. Who wants to I think it's a question for Ron for the uh, Theresa May. Um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, Theresa May, the Home Secretary in, in Britain, um, uh, has has put into into practice a policy that has been on the statute books um, for, I believe, around 10 years or so, uh, which is a policy where you can um, remove someone's citizenship. Okay. Um, and in other words, you... you you basically cast them into a kind of oblivion, right, where they are stateless, um, because in many cases they have no other nationality, right? And so this is something that has been on the statute books for a while, uh, and, and now in the last couple of years is being implemented. Um, so what happens is, is that you, you um, are outside of the UK, maybe visiting family in uh, Somalia or Pakistan, um, while you're outside of the country, the Home Secretary kind of issues an administrative instruction um, with no judicial process attached to it that basically strips you of your, of your British citizenship and then you are uh, unable to return to the UK um, and you, you are effectively stateless. And in a few of those cases, um, that process then paves the way for those people to, um, to be killed in drone strikes in Somalia. Um, and so what What's happening there is that this is a way for the US <laughs> to carry out drone strikes on people that would otherwise have been British citizens, and therefore that would have been a serious political issue within the United Kingdom. Um, but because they get stripped of, of their citizenship before the strike, no one heard, of, heard about it. Um, in, a, in another case, um, the guy who um, was um, lived in lived in London in North London for a rather long time, um, was a youth worker with the, um, with the, the British Somali community in North London, um, was under pressure for a number of years to become an informant for um, the intelligence services, um, refused to do so. And then um, he was stripped of his citizenship while he was in Somalia visiting family. Um, he was then um, uh, arrested possibly arrested isn't the right word, um, kidnapped maybe, um, and um, held in Djibouti for a while and has then been rendered to New York and he's currently being held 
I think in Connecticut. Um, no, he's in Brooklyn. He's in Brooklyn, right. Me Mehdi Hashi. Mehdi Hashi. Um, and he's, he's now facing charges here. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is you know, um, Britain doesn't have a constitution, right? Um, we, we have a system where parliament can, can pass a law and, um, and there's, no, there's no kind of constitutional process by which that can be overturned. Um, and, and so you can pass a law um, that enables Home Secretary to basically strip away your citizenship at a whim. Um, and and um, that's, that's something that's just a recent development in the last couple of years that that's been put into practice. Um, do you want to speak about the New Jersey ruling? I mean, just a ridiculous ruling. Uh, I don't know what more to say. Uh, basically, uh, students at Rutgers, some imam in New Jersey, they brought a suit against NYPD surveillance and monitoring through the ACLU, I'm not sure, through one of these legal Muslim organizations. Muslim advocates and CCR. Muslim advocates and CCR. Hi, Lely. <laughs> <laughs> so they brought this lawsuit, and basically, like you said, the judge said, you know, how dare you bring this lawsuit? Muslims, the only suffering is Muslim, Muslims felt was the fact that the AP revealed uh, through Matt Apuzo and Adam Goldman's coverage of wide-scale surveillance. They, if they didn't know, if they were oblivious to this surveillance and monitoring, uh, it would have been all right, but you know, now that they know, that's the only some weird legal legalese that that's the only suffering that they actually felt the Muslim community, not the fact that this imam and the students of Rutgers were heavily surveilled and monitored under no real reason besides the fact that they were Muslims. Should I take the Pakistan question sure. to start with? Well, well, I mean, I think we've been seeing these games being played by the Pakistani government. Um, and I leave that to ask them to kind of say which one is the state and the military. We've got two parallel governments that, that <coughs> operate in Pakistan. <coughs> they have been building up this narrative that we have seen them do before when it was the previous Salat operation. And it's really been a countdown to the same um, actions that the military takes. And it follows very particular... Um, path. So the first thing that happens is that there's, you know, <coughs> uh, you know there's a, the government puts out this narrative of there's a lot of terrorism, there's a lot of uh, criminality, criminality, then it turns into terrorism. Uh oh, they're coming into the cities, they're coming into like Pakistan, sorry, in Lahore, uh, Karachi. Then they go ahead and pass all these laws um, that allow for even more preventative detention that are always passed through as ordinances, our parliament doesn't like passing any laws. Um, we just count on whatever presidential decree comes through. And at the same time, what you see on the other side is these talks about, well, let's have some peace talks, let's have some peace talks, let's have some peace talks. Um, and invariably, when the peace talks take place, there's the bombings are stepped up. Um, and then you'll have a bunch of the people who are a part of the peace talks saying, you know, um, actually, something really interesting happened because along with this, that, that this is all the countdown to the Swat operation. We all, I mean, I think anybody who's vaguely rational in Pakistan knows how this plays out because we've been through this drama before. Um, so it was very easy to spot it this time around. Uh, but what you did see on one side was um, the media and the role that the media is playing in this narrative. So what you saw on one hand was you know, these, no offense, but like really uh, bearded, you know, mullahs, fanatics, you know, going to go and talk to the Taliban. And at some point, it's very difficult to tell which one's the Taliban and which ones are the Pakistanis going to negotiate with the Taliban for peace talk. And then suddenly, yeah, the statement would come out that the Taliban want to have Sharia law imposed in like, you know, the, the, these parts. And then what you see is an entire, it's a backlash from the liberals, progressives, you know, in the media saying, how dare the Pakistani state try to negotiate our, uh, you know, uh, uh, negotiate with a bunch of people who absolutely refuse to recognize what the state is. And then you'll have a bunch of uh, feminists writing, oh, I wonder how these men are all deciding what I'm going to wear tomorrow, as in, you know, about uh, how Sharia we're going to go. And then you saw that on the same night on TV, on live TV in Pakistan, you had the negotiators from the Pakistani side saying, this conversation never took place. So who's putting out these narratives? They were screaming, saying, this is not what we went to talk about. This is not what we talked about. Um, 
And then somebody said, uh, one of them, uh, who's now become my favorite Mufti, by the way, he said something really interesting because he, uh, he, he actually went on TV and he said, look, you know, if you look at them as a political party or whatever party, you know, you go to the MQM, they want to be prime minister and they want to be president. If you go to Imran Khan, he'll say, I want to be president. You go to the PPP, they have their candidate. So if the Taliban, even if they are saying that, yes, we would like to be Amirul Mominin, how is that any different than the claims that other political parties are making? We'd say the same thing to them. Uh, yeah, please get elected and go through parliament and go that way. But this whole operation, really, I mean, it's a setup to kind of criminalize and uh, to actually, it's an excuse to um, hold more and more people that actually in Pakistan under these laws that the government has passed. And people who really, I mean, like Asim said, there's other things at play over here. And the people that you see getting picked up under these terrorism laws are not the people that, you know, are uh, even the government claims to be targeting for counterterrorism operations. I mean, there's information, we, I mean, there is strong indications that under the massive amounts of money that is being poured in to counter terrorism training and all of that, that the, the Pakistani state is actually, they're capturing the wrong people. So they're rounding up again the poor laborers, drug addicts, and they're just shipping them off into jail under false identities so that they can be sh demonstrate that, hang on, look, we captured 400 terrorists. Um, and now they're being kept in, you know, such and such jail. Um, but again, because they're operating under these counterterrorism, you know, new laws that have been passed, um, such as the pa Protection of Pakistan Ordinance, uh, Action in Native Civil Powers, regulations, you never get to know who they are, where they are, what they're being held for, how long they're going to be held, nothing of that sort. I think um, just going back to your last question about the... Um, operations, you know, the army, people in Viziristan, and I'm speaking specific, I mean, in, in <coughs> the tribal areas in general, um, are, you know, the tribal areas, as many of you may already know, are not governed by the, the Pakistani constitution. They're governed by still British era colonial regulations called the frontier crimes regulations um, that, you know, um, allow for collective punishment um, allow for a whole host of draconian policies. It was only in the last election this past year that um, they, uh, the people in, uh, living in FATA, the federally administered tribal areas, were able to um, actually have functioning political parties. Uh, they didn't even get the right to vote till 1996. Um, and so FATA in general has been you know, there's no police in FATA. There's a whole host of para everything from militias, paramilitary forces, right up to the army. And they have been doing in FATA what they are supposed to do for a long time, which is control this area for a whole host of reasons. Um, first, when the British were there, the British set up this system, severed this piece of territory as a buffer zone between British India and Afghanistan on the other side. Um, and they used this territory as a buffer zone. When the Pakistani state was founded, it was used for um, training grounds for Kashmir uh, to wage the war in Kashmir. Um, and then, you know, to uh, raise the Mujahideen during the Cold War against the Soviet Union. Um, and now, you know, that area is again, it's under a certain kind of erasure, particularly Waziristan, where the majority of the attacks happen. You cannot actually, in North Waziristan, you cannot go there without uh, an army uh, envoy, like a person who's escorting you. The military has used this area and its people quite badly for a very long time. So for example, after um, bin Laden um, was killed and it came out that you know the polio, uh, the reason the, they used polio vaccinations as a ruse, right? So then uh, the militants in North Waziristan said, well, we're banning polio vaccinations in North and South Waziristan. And so the government, so again, these people do not have representation. What they have is something called a political agent who is somebody who is appointed and who is uh, directly from the federal government, right? And so the political agent of North Waziristan said, okay, if you guys are gonna comply with the militants, um, you are not going to be eligible for any of the government, getting any of the government papers. These are national ID cards, passports, uh, deeds to houses, uh, land issues, so basically anything having to, you know, basically bringing life to a 
grinding halt. Again, there have been in the last year, every time a few uh, soldiers get attacked, Pakistani soldiers get attacked, there are intense curfews in the area. Um, I was just speaking to someone there like a few days ago, and you know, they're talking now about these, um, you know, as you, as you mentioned, there were these, again, there's been an oper attacks by helicopter gunships, and they fire indiscriminately, and they kill lots of people. Um, and the people in the area are so fed up because they're caught between the militants who are waging an anti-colonial war in Afghanistan, but they're also quite brutal within North Waziristan to people. Um, so they're caught between them, they're caught between the Pakistani army, and they're caught between the drone attacks, right? And so in that nexus, when the government has so utterly abandoned them, they're actually, uh, you know, I was asking a couple of people from that area what you know, what the mood is, and people are saying, we just, we want peace at all costs. We actually don't care about the broader questions of representation, et cetera. Just have the negotiations and give us peace. Um, and that's, you know, and it's, it's utterly, I don't know, it's, 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 it's obscene that this is the situation to which they have been reduced is to demand uh, simply peace, which should actually be a starting point, not the end I game. I think nobody in Pakistan believes that the, the, the negotiations were ever to actually negotiate peace. I mean, the, 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 sorry, the right. pattern we talk about is that they just, you know, they say, okay, look, we're trying to negotiate with them. Then they paint the other side as total crazies who want to impose Sharia law. And contrary to popular belief, Pakistan is really not that. Yeah, um, we're, we're not Iran, Saudi Arabia, like it's not that religiously conservative traditionally um, and then you freak the population out by saying ah they want sharia and look at them I mean this they you know they don't believe in the state and they're there to subvert all the you know it's the state institutions that we have and then you know some pact is broken or some understanding is broken and then the army comes in and bombs I mean this is what they did with the Savat operations, and which this is, is what exactly they don't what's want. happening again yeah, yeah which is what they don't want they don't ask, so at the level of politics is totally true I don't think the government is necessarily serious about the peace talks, but from the perspective of people yeah. who are living in that area, yeah. they'd rather have that compromise um, and deal with that than actually have a milit another military yeah. operation. That's you know, been my impression. Um, no, I mean, it's even if Pakistan didn't believe in this narrative, once you sold a certain story, you're going to have to stick with it. You sold a story that this is a, you know, this is a haven for Al Qaeda fighters. How are you going to come back, wake up one morning and say, oh, actually, you know, uh, and they started this nonsense back in 2003, when the first military convoys went in, when they did their first, <laughs> remember, they did their Lashkars that were running around the mountains looking for Al Qaeda hideouts. And back at least until, until Naik Muhammad was killed, you could go in. And I went in with these Lashkars in 2004. And it was all a fraud. It was a fake. We wrote about it. They, you know, they, the army would convince people to go and say, find Al-Qaeda hideouts. And these people would find these fake hideouts and hand over these fake men and say, these were Al-Qaeda fighters. And I was there watching the stuff. And we wrote about it. And it was just a game. And because the game you have, at least I've, you know, again, I can only work with public data. But the game you want to play is, yes, there's Al-Qaeda and there's terrorists. And here they are, they're TTP one day. And you know, in Balochistan, they are, you know, Lashke Jangvi and so on. And this is just politics by other means. And certainly in Balochistan, it's very obvious that the religious fanaticism is state supported. I know that people get very upset when I say that, especially in open society. But I have said so, that this sectarian violence against Shia Hazaras is part of state policy. It is not sectarian violence against Shia Hazaras. It is part of state policy to distract from what is happening in Balochistan. So, Waziristan, we also have some strategic goals in Waziristan, we as in this, the military, the state as, and, and also this, now should we be celebrating like 70 year long relationship with the American, you know, uh, with the American imperial interest. This is not a, this is not something that we can just throw away, we as in Pakistan. We signed it in 1956. We renew it every few years. It's a very, very important relationship. There isn't a single military senior member of military brass who hasn't trained in the U.S. will come here and and fought for, like Ziaul Haq, who fought for the Americans in Jordan and elsewhere, and Pakistani soldiers who are in Bahrain right now repressing the peace movements there. You know, you have to look past these, these geographical definitions don't work anymore. You know, we, we are looking at 
you know, factors that go beyond just Pakistani military. The Pakistani military serves interests from Black September in Jordan to Bahrain today. And these are being served, you know, at the behest of maybe, you know, other nations, including the Americans. So in that context, we need to concoct this war, like because the Americans are pulling out and someone has to continue to fight this massive Al-Qaeda presence, which is, you know, not going to disappear. As we concocted the SWAT war, because in SWAT, I can tell you from personal experience, while they were start hunting for the head of the TTP, Maulana Fazlullah, running around with the tanks in the streets, I was having breakfast with him. And he was sitting right there. It wasn't even a kilometer away from the closest military checkpoint, and we could walk in with my fixer and, and sit with him for two hours, and outside the military is like, yeah, we're, we're, it's a manhunt. <laughs> You know, you're like, okay, really, I mean, if because you can't go to these areas, because they only take you on tours, after the Swat War, I remember there was these, all, they took the New York Times on this, on this tour of the war zone, and there's this great video of this completely, you know, sort of deer in headlights CNN journalist being taken into a cave, and they bought out <laughs> these weapons from, like, 1857, and I'm looking at this guy like, are you serious? Like, do you really think... That a military that has the weapons we do was fighting men who have, you know, what, what are they called those? Can, you know, like blunderbusses or something, you know. <laughs> and they took them on this tour. It's on the New York Times. I wrote about it on my blog and so on. I mean, this, it's, it's, you know, we, we got upset about videos of them thrashing that woman in SWAT, speaking of feminism that we love so much in liberal law and so on. But a few days later, when videos appeared about Pakistani army lining up men in SWAT and shooting them point, point blank, no one said anything. No one said anything. One was true because it fitted a narrative of liberalism or whatever it was, whether it was true or not, nothing, it was enough. The video was enough. The next one, which showed an actual war crime taking place by our state organizations, Nothing was said. Men were being lined up and shot. And when civilians said that that was what was happening, you just ignored it. Now you're, they're doing the same. They're, they, if they're telling you that who, they're killing civilians, we just dismiss it because you know, the, state, the state says no. And you have journalists who are, in fact, if you look at, we have had these discussions, and Declan Walsh and I have had a back and forth on this. If you look at the way Pakistan is reported and these wars are reported, 95% of the sources of those reporting are going to be official government, either American or Pakistani sources. They have absolutely no independent. I remember Carlotta Gall once wrote a piece that they have discovered that 95 Al-Qaeda soldiers, fighters, have come across the border from Afghanistan. This is a woman who's never left Islamabad. How did Carl Carlotta Gall count 95 Taliban or Al-Qaeda fighters, let alone Taliban, coming across the border in Pakistan? So your sources are, you know, are controlled. We are not allowed to go in anymore. You know, they claim humanitarian crisis. We can't go in to confirm anything. Nobody can go in. They're just making these things up. So, and it's not, it's, it's not. We're not being allowed in because it's the Pakistani state that yeah, the, you can't. Go yes, in. it's the Pakistani you state. Ask people from Waziristan, they're like, come with us. They're yeah. very nice. We'll let you in. Is but the, it's the yeah. military check post that will not let people in. So. You know, I mean, to say that it's all, of, you know, even to say, you know, that these, it's not real it would be unfair. But looking at the evidence so far, just the way we draw conclusions about Bagram, because I have no evidence about Bagram. But if someone tells me, oh, yeah, there's no more torture in Bagram, but I can look at what's happening in Guantanamo where there is oversight and torture continues, I'm just laughing and saying, are you really kidding me? So you have this perfect prison where you have no oversight whatsoever. Yeah, there's no torture there. They're actually really nice to them. Where, you know, I mean, drug it's drug rehab, whatever. So we, you know, we have to look elsewhere to draw, to deduce. That's all I'm left with because I have not. So you've been lying all these years. At least from 2004, I have evidence that we were lying about our, about the presence of these fighters there or who these men were and what we are doing there to show that we are very committed to the American narrative of the war, which is what it is. We are now in the service of an, Amer of an, sort of an adopted purchase narrative, which needs to be sustained because we have invested so much in it. How are you going to explain that 500 men were sold as Al-Qaeda fighters to the Americans and suddenly say, oh, yeah, actually, no, you know, they, yeah. No, you're going to continue to argue that they are Al-Qaeda men. What do you do? You're going to detain them when they come out from Bagram without never having been charged, never having been accused of a crime, but we will put them in jail in Pakistan because, you know, they're deadly. 
So there's these continuities of narratives which are now, you know, impossible to take back without looking like, you know, like looking like the idiots you look like when with Abu Zubaydah. That great mastermind for whom we wrote the torture memos turns out to be nothing. Now what do you do? 12 or 11 years later, this, this you know, the, 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 the massive manhunt, we, 83 times he was waterboarded. We had thousands of men running around all over this country breaking terror plots and so on and so on. And then it turns out, oh, oops. He, uh, he was just staying at the hotel. So I think that we, Pakistan has the same, we've invested in a certain narrative that now needs to be continued. And, uh, you know, and by the way, Taliban is also a very sweeping phrase. I have another issue with this one because having worked with foreign international reporters in Pakistan, anyone with a beard who sits down for prayer is suddenly becomes a Taliban. And any interpret, any kind of conservative behavior in the tribal areas is perceived to be some kind of repressive, religious, religious repression from outside without recognizing that, well, they are generally a very conservative people anyways on, in that part of, of the country. Not everything is about radicalization, not everything is about some post 9-11 pathology, but it gets, it gets easily painted that way because it's Taliban, is Taliban, and that seems to, that seems to fit a nice, clean narrative. So I think there's some problems of, certainly for, for a journalist, like for me, it's a, it's a huge issue of language and, and you know, labels. There, you know, Al-Qaeda has now become meaningless. We don't even know what that means, but, you know, TTP, where did that come from? I mean, you know, suddenly everyone's in TTP. You know, once it was Lashkar Taiba, like five years ago, everybody was Lashkar Taiba or Lashkar Jangvi. Now everybody's TTP and, and, you know, so it's, you're working with very, Fluid, you're working with very fluid language is all I can say because we have no evidence. You know, we're stuck in Islamabad. Foreign reporters get visas for one city. You know, there are huge problems of interpretation and evidence and understanding, basically. Which is... <laughs> I think this is great because just before I go on to your question, the, the resonances between obviously what happens in Pakistan and what happens in the U.S. and the U.S.'s, um, U.S. deep states investments and interests and the Pakistani deep states investments and interests have always aligned, and, you know, as, as Asim was pointing out. And so the, it's, it's not even just about covering up your oops moments. It's really, it is about that. But it is about also like, um, the people who buy the narrative, right? So it's not as if everyone is calling this stuff out when right. when when the you know the, the sort of lid is blown open occasionally. It's not like people are saying, "Hello, you know, maybe this is going to lead me to question everything else you're saying," right? So I think that's the other thing we have to constantly grapple with is the deep investment that certain interests have. Um, you know, pe people, ordinary people, as well as you know people um, tied to the military-industrial complex all around the world. In precisely these kinds of stories and these narratives, and um, you know, how do you deal with the cognitive dissonance? That's really mm. the game, right? Mm. Just how do you mm. deal with the cognitive dissonance that this might create? But you know, I think the the connections are very obvious between the the kinds of things that you you see in the case of um, Fahad and others like him, um, the concocted stories, the you know, and I mean, just it reminds me very quickly of like um, the resonance between the. The photograph you showed of the F-16 purchase and the celebration of that, and the recent um, graph that everyone must have seen of the U.S.'s uh, military expenditure versus everything else in the U.S. and it actually just looks like, you know, Pakistan's. Mm -hmm. in, you know, for those of us who are familiar with that argument within Pakistan in terms of what the Pakistani military spends on itself and you know in terms of buying all these like goodies versus what it bothers to spend on health and education, it's exactly the same. And it's the resonance between Pakistan and the U.S. are just so sort of constant for I think many of us. By the way, sorry, just just that one point you made. Did anyone read the the court ruling on the NYPD surveillance? Did you did you read? It's actually it's very interesting because towards the end the the judge, God bless him, he actually says, well, what what after nine eleven, what did you expect would happen? Right? I mean, 11 Muslims, apparently Muslims, you know, can carry out this act. It's inevitable that we would then scan every single bloody Muslim in this country. So why are they so surprised? He actually acknowledged that, you know, there is a racist generalizing element to it. And it's, that's exactly, and it was fine. And, and in Pakistan, it's the same. 
that you have arrived at a point where it's okay that, that we can, you know, carry out these actions against certain kinds of Pakistanis. I mean, Burka Avenger, for example, the cartoon that all the liberals love so much, you know, depicts a generic, you know, Muslim, radical, bearded kind of person who is actually beaten and killed quite frequently in these cartoons. So you, you have this sort of, you know, we, we have created our own sort of delusional idea of what fanaticism and so on looks like. And we do associate with something we also recognize as Muslims because, you know, we in Lahore, we are not like those Muslims. We are, you know, cooler Muslims. And we are now worried about the uncool Muslims. We've gone to that extent. So I think this kind of, this, you know, and I think this is where Arun and your, your work probably touches on this. There is a very deep sort of racist, I, I, you know, uh, underpinning to all of this, which is not just here, it's also in Pakistan about how we speak about these people in Waziristan or these TTPs, you know, imagine what TTP is or whatever, yeah. that they can be dealt with through these draconian laws which were passed for a month ago. They can be left in prison, they can be, or they, they be and they should be droned. Many in Pakistan, you know, people have said dinner parties, like, you know, we should be bombing more. We should nuke these areas. You know, these people are, you know, they're sick. They're, you know, this is the way we talk about it. No one talks about law, at least here, you know, I agree with Madhya completely, but at least you guys, you know, here there is a discussion about legalese. Pakistan, there's no discussion about law. You know, not, you know, it's not, it's about action. We want, we want action. Um, so, a question with, with the focus on Karachi. Um, so, usually with, in, in the wake of uh, warfare and fighting and drone strikes, there is usually an increase in violent crime, sexual assault, things like that. Um, so, has that been present in Karachi. Has drone strikes actually been in the city folk for just that? No. Um, also, I'm just kind of curious, how is the justice system in Karachi structurally? And how effective is it at both getting people who are executing crimes? And uh, how many people, like, how is that? And how, how exact are, how is that the crimes defined? And, you know, how many people are getting convicted wrongly or getting off easily? Um, how pervasive is the threat of, like, like, the, like, the local government being complicit, like, like, just the enforcement of daily life? And um, how strangified is that? You know, like, is that class, you know, religious, uh, gender, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, Pakistan actually has a pretty, um, uh, what's the word for it? Um, there is a legal system, and it has been around for a while. It's modeled on the, uh, you know, again, it's left over by the Brits. There was a, an attempt by, under the Zia years, to bring in more and more Islamic jurisprudence and Sharia, but it's a real hodgepodge of, um, uh, of colonial common law um, with this kind of badly superimposed um, certain sections that are supposed to make it more uh, compliant with a particular brand of Sharia. Um, but the, the criminal justice system is quite established. I mean, I, when, it, when you compare it to something like Afghanistan or something, um, we, do have a, uh, we do have institutions and we do have system. Now, how is it applied? I think the problems that plague the criminal justice system are the same as they would be actually to the United States as well. I mean, Pakistan, has the largest death row population in the world because we have over 23 crimes that merit the death penalty. That includes cyber crimes, and it also, that was a post 9 11 um, uh, thing. Another ordinance passed by <laughs> the president very quietly. Um, and they also include murder and blasphemy and a bunch of, uh, you know, those kind of things. So, um, how is the death penalty applied? Um, same way as you would see it being applied here, where you see the very, very poor. Um, and economically disadvantaged people being sentenced to death. You don't see the rich people coming, you know, being uh, put on death row and actually ended up ending up being executed. Um, there is massive corruption um, within the police. Um, there is intimidation on the part of the judges as well in certain areas. Karachi is a very different beast though, and, 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 and Maybe these two can speak about Karachi because I'm from Lahore. So compared to what <laughs> you know, Lahore is very homogenous, and you know we have our we have our own system going on. But Karachi is plagued by the violence in Karachi is due to 
things that these guys can talk about better. But what we do see, uh, we do have some cases in Karachi. And, um, what we do see is the judges, you know, up until the high court as well, being incredibly um, prosecution-minded because they are very aware of the high level of crime, blah, 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 in, in, in their city. Uh, and so you see them being a lot less sympathetic um, towards granting anybody, even bail, for example. Somebody would make a clear case for bail, wouldn't get it in Karachi because of the you know, high crime rate. And again, what you are seeing now with the recent focus of the prime minister and his new, one of the first things he did was he went to Karachi himself. He hardly turns up in parliament, which is five minutes down the road from where he is. He's hardly ever turned up in parliament, but he did go down to Karachi. Um, and the whole push was, we need to get Karachi under control. There's, you know, after Waziristan, it's, you know, Karachi is going to, uh, all the terrorists are moving there. Um, and really linking the political and other violence that has inherently been Karachi with suddenly within this framework of, um, you know, terrorism, terrorism. And so what you are going to see, I think, is a lot more egregious. And there's already been stuff. People have started writing about this already. That, okay, you've had these sweeping laws um, that have been passed even in specifically for Karachi, but who are you actually picking up and what are you trying them for? Um, and that there's, um, uh, you know, a lot of human rights abuses that are now starting to take place um, within this new narrative that's being forced onto Karachi. Well, there hasn't been any drone strike in a city in no, Pakistan. No. There may be one soon, but as yet... I don't yet, think they'd ever dare do it in no, Lahore. Okay. Quetta, maybe. The American citizens that no, they're chasing... But not Lahore. Yeah, yeah, but they haven't, haven't done it in the city. So no, no. I think the closest was... All the politicians live there. They're not going to want their, you know, <laughs> themselves, their homes drone. <laughs> um, how, how, what kind of uh, police violence is it? Is it more quiet or is it more... Mild? Police violence? Yeah. yeah. No, it's extrajudicial killing. So there's, there's, it's, you know, they'll, they'll have encounters, police encounters. There'll be gang warfare. The police and the army and the rangers will be called in, um, and a lot of people die. But Pakistan has a lot of problems with the police, and just in the regular criminal justice system, the police torturing. I mean, you have a, it's endemic and it's systematic. Um, so then you, Karachi has again a whole host of other people. You have the what is it called? Not the frontier court. The rangers, rangers right? Yeah. You have the it's rangers there, which is a paramilitary. But I mean, the police in in Pakistan and as in India, they are not. You know, it's not an investigative force. Again, yeah. looking at the legacy of why how police was built or put together in the colonial regime, they are basically a riot control force. <coughs> and by and large, uh, maybe a few sophisticated areas in, in the cities of Pakistan. But by and large, the police is really just a controlling mechanism to keep sort of the the population under control and they, you know, they are, they're not able to, you know, they have no skills really to do investigative work, forensics and, you know, things like that. They, that's not what they do. What they do is they come and beat the shit out of you and get you to confess and, you know, just go and get people that other people want. That's sort of their main function. But they're trying to change that. So there's a huge focus on police reform and these kinds of things going on, have been going on for a few years, but... If you go out of the main city or like, or get, go out of one nice neighborhood Karachi, you'll see the police are like goons, basically. They're, you get a phone call, they act. If they don't get a phone call, they don't act. I've seen a lot of that, like in Punjab. You know, if the, a murder happens, they're not gonna move until the, the phone rings and says they should go check it out. So. Lots of connections between the police and yeah. the US yeah. as well, you know, in terms sure. of the function of the police officers. Hi. In, I, I used to work for a press freedom group called the Committee to Protect Journalists. We, we did a, a very extensive report on violence against journalists in Pakistan and the, the cycle of impunity um, involved. And, and I'm just wondering, obviously, these, these are people who are touching on some of the very issues that you have been working on and talking about and that are, in a way, a threat to the narrative that's been constructed and that you have described. So I'm wondering what kind of, um, have you in your own work faced any of this and do you see any way out? Okay, sorry, we need to be out of here in about five minutes. Okay. <laughs> there is someone to kick us out. There yeah. is someone to kick us out. There's always somebody to kick you out. <laughs> <coughs> 
Yeah. I've got no track. Are we still so. recording? Are we still recording? Are we still recording? Are we still recording? Into the, Anna, are we still especially recording? going no. into the tribal areas. You, know. you just want to line up. I mean, when I've gone to Balochistan, there's been stuff. When you go to South Punjab, uh, where, um, which is sort of a lab for the state to produce and collaborate and work with these various non-state um, actors, you do get followed. And I've had interactions with the intelligence agencies. Um, and also Balochistan, they're tracking you wherever you go. I haven't had, uh, I went to Savat after the operation in 2009. And, but the thing is, in my case, it is on the one hand quite dangerous, but it's first, first and foremost, it's dangerous for the journalists, the local journalists. So Hayat Lahan, for example, in I think 2006, if I'm not mistaken, he was one of the first journalists who got the shards of the missiles uh, from drone attacks, right? And he was, and they said, made in the US, and he was trying to get that information out. He was abducted and, and killed. Um, so those are the people that are first and foremost in, Absolutely. you know. And so for people like me, I am a Pakistani citizen, um, but I have a certain amount of social and cultural capital, as I think everybody does. So it doesn't mean it's not dangerous, but it's not dangerous in the same way that it is for the local journalists, the like everyday beat reporter. I think in, in Waziristan, um, or in, in, in some of these conflict areas, what also gets tricky is that many journalists are also informants. Yeah. Okay. So you have to keep in mind that when something, so after, for example, Naik Muhammad was tricked into coming down from the mountains and they, they, uh, they basically... Um, um, it was a peace deal. It was a peace deal. I was piece, in Waziristan when he was received by military commanders and garlanded, and then two days later they killed him with a missile strike. A number of journalists were killed by the local communities because they were then suspected of having acted as collaborators, and then the rest of us, us fled. Um, but I think also the danger emerges from the fact that like someone like me, I'm working with public information. I'm not doing like any you know, great investigative pieces. So the state doesn't really care so much about stuff that I may be probing or asking about. Um, I think the people who are who are in more danger are the ones who are asking the questions that you know give us an insight into the background of what's happening. Whereas you know, many certainly I am not working with anything like that. I can work with public information, and I'm going out and meeting people. And people that they don't want us to meet I would actually not even be in their homes. They would just like in Balochistan, or they would just, you know, as they have a press closure all over Balochistan, so you know, the driver will tell you, I won't take you there, the army doesn't have to tell you, that kind of stuff. But, so, I think, you know, the local journalists are the ones who can probably give you more sense of what it takes. So, like, SWAT fixers have refused, like, anything I've suggested, that, hey, I want to come and do, they just said, no, don't. <laughs> you know, so I ask, you know, the weather's too cold, the food's not ready, you know, stuff yeah. like that, which is their way of saying, you know, so, so the yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's so they know what the narrative needs to be if they want to keep working. Of course, the threats are always there from the state, and and uh, yes, of course. But I think we, you know, are not the ones facing. Like I don't get you know phone call at least not yet. But. Uh, <laughs> It came out in um, November, and it was on Democracy Now! and Vice actually initially ran it, and then it was on Democracy Now! And we're going to be having the screening at Columbia on, I think, March 12th. But you can see it, all the information is on the website, woundsofvizierstan.com. So, isn't it, isn't it or on it'll Democracy be up. Now? And two, three other it's announcements. Yeah, yeah. So we have the, just, the um, No Separate Justice campaign has these regular vigils um, outside the NCC in Manhattan, first Monday of every month. So I hope that some of you will join us there. Um, we have two other events coming up while Sara and Asim are in town. One is going to be in Colombia on Thursday. Yes. On the 27th. Um, yeah. The 27th. Yeah, um, and one is going to be at NYU on Friday the 28th. So I hope to see some of you at the event. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you, all thank you very much. Time.